Mr. Zebley, roll call, please. Mrs. Denny? Here. Mrs. Ellis? Here. Mrs. Esler? Ms. Hilferty? Here. Mrs. Jones? Mrs. Powell? Here. Mr. Seasock? Here. Mr. Tinsley? Here. Mr. Armour? Here. Thank you, Mr. Zebley. Um, 2.01 is approval of minutes. Motion is to approve the minutes of the regular board meeting from June 24th, 2020. I have this motion. So moved. Second. Questions or comments? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion passes. 2.02 is the invoice listing. Motion is to approve the invoice listing from June through July 2020. Do I have this motion? So moved. Second. Questions or comments? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion passes. 2.03 is the treasurer's report. Mr. Zebley. As of April 30th, 2020, Pendoco's balance was $33,778,625. During May 2020, local, state, and federal revenues totaled $1,712,398. Disbursements were issued in the amount of $2,992,076. As of May 31st, 2020, Pendoco's current balance is $32,498,947. The motion is to approve the treasurer's report for May 2020. So moved. Second. Questions or comments on the treasurer's report? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion passes. 2.04 is a budget transfer report. Motion is to approve the budget transfer report from June through July of 2020. Do I have this motion? So moved. Second. Questions or comments? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion passes. Uh, number three is a superintendent's report by, by Dr. Steinhoff. Uh, this is uh, the time where Dr. Stonov is going to present a uh, portion of his reopening plan as well as other uh, things going on in the school district. So maybe lengthy, if I can uh, ask for everyone's patience just to hang in there and uh, get through it and see what Dr. Stonov has to say. Thank you, Mr. Armour. Uh, I'm pulling up a PowerPoint presentation. I'll be sharing a screen in just a moment. Uh, and, and you're correct. It, it is a lengthy presentation tonight, um, as it should be as we are presenting the administrative background for the school board to make a decision on our pathway to reopening for the fall. So in just one moment, I'll pull that PowerPoint up and I will be happy to go through it and answer questions at the end with regards to this presentation. Thumbs up if you can see my screen, not quite yet. Try it again. Got it now, thank you. Yes, sir, there it is. I will move over. So thank you again. Uh, tonight is the first time that our school board has had an opportunity. I'm gonna speak off the cuff and stay away from some scripted comments as well so that I can go through the PowerPoint and uh, really share with you quite a bit of information that we've accrued over the last few weeks in preparing to uh, get our students back to school in the most safe format that we possibly could do. Um, as many people who are following this closely know, school districts are tasked with creating a health and safety reopening plan that's going to enable schools to possibly open up under a number of different uh, options that school boards have to decide. Uh, throughout the county, I believe we have two school districts uh, that have already approved the reopening plan. Most school districts are continuing to look at different options, uh, evaluate circumstances. You know, as we know, the situation with COVID-19 is changing. My gosh, it feels like by the hour at times, even tonight, you know, the effects of COVID-19 affected our decision on moving our school board meeting over to a Zoom virtual meeting tonight. We had intended to have an in-person meeting at Northland Middle School late this afternoon. The governor put out an order with some changes with, that had to do with uh, 
the ability to have large gatherings. And we recognize in the spirit of that, even though it's not beginning till 12 o'clock tonight, that we really should, in the spirit of it, not hold a large gathering tonight out of respect to that order. So we wanted to quickly move over to a Zoom option tonight. And we also will, I should note, limit the agenda items that the board's going to vote on uh, in the spirit of complete transparency and push those items back to our, June, uh, to our July 29th meeting, which it appears will also be done uh, via Zoom as well. But tonight, uh, we're going to share with you kind of our process for coming uh, up with a, a proposal or recommendation, a number of options for the uh, school board to consider with respect to this issue of how do we get kids back to school? You know, how, how do we get back to the place that we were prior to March 13th? And if we can't get back to that place, what is the best option that we can create uh, for our kids so that they have an experience that was better than most of the experience between March and June? As I, as I mentioned, this is extremely fluid. Uh, you know, we, we just a week ago, most districts really felt that we were in a very good place to be able to reopen our doors and come back to school on a day to day basis and meet all of our students needs. But things have changed as school administrators continue to dig a little deeper into the weeds and really examine what this means to get students back in and have the students and staff uh, attend to school in a health and safely, safely manner. Uh, it is much more challenging than I think a lot of districts expected and which is added to the challenge is the fact that we're all trained educators. None of us are trained epidemiologists. You know, we're not trained medical personnel. So states have been kind of begging for guidance from the federal government and school districts have been begging for guidance from the state and school administrators are begging for guidance from school districts and teachers will come back begging for guidance from school administrators and parents will ask for guidance. And it kind of just goes, starts at the top and works its way down. We're at a place really where we really have to stop creating questions and start generating solutions. And tonight is an effort to start generating solutions. So we're gonna talk about our you know, current recommendation and a rationale for reopening, which as I said, has shifted uh, considerably just in the last few days. Review some key elements of our reopening plan, discuss some of the unresolved challenges and possible solutions, and then also discuss the next steps and the expectation for a final proposal which gets approved by the board on July 29th. So I should really point out, we have a large number of attendees in our meeting tonight uh, that uh, none of the details, you know, the specific details for, you know, how might a certain classroom operate or what will the impact be to a certain extracurricular program? None of those will be uh, officially approved tonight. We are just bringing information to the board so that on July 29th, they can make the best informed decision that they can make. And it's quite a challenge for them. I start with a caveat though, right? The circumstances regarding coronavirus and school's ability to reopen is changing weekly. Right? Just a week ago, right? I sent a message out to the community indicating that it was our intention to open to school for every student every day, five days a week. Um, but conditions have changed a little bit, right? And we don't have that high level of confidence in that intention as we did just a week ago. And I liken it very much to, you know, uh, the morning snow calls that superintendents have to make. At four in the morning, you might say, we're good to go, we can open. But then two hours later, if you get the call from transportation, they say the conditions have changed. I'm on the front lines. I've looked at it a little more closely. In that regard, then, you realize, you know what, maybe we can't move forward. And you don't like to make a change, but you have to do what's right for safety of students and staff. So although, you know, regional conditions, you know, are more favorable, than last spring, um, it's still serious, right? Trends can redirect quickly. And the country continues to set national records for total cases of COVID. And also I, the caveat is that our experts continue to learn more about this virus. It almost seems like by the day. So guidance can change. Information we're presenting tonight is based on conditions today, but we will build a plan that will be prepared for potential changes. So the first question that you know our task force began with, you know, can we safely reopen schools? And the answer to that was yes, we could. But significant modifications are going to have to be in place. Significant meaning it's going to substantial changes to the classroom experience that our students typically were accustomed to. It would involve changes to schedules, procedures in the classroom environment. Yes, we can open, but health and safety would have to be the priority at all times. There's things that we just couldn't take for granted. Patience and understanding is going to have to absolutely be key. Um, we understand that in a lot of places, surveys done in any district show that there is absolutely a split 
in interest in terms of should our students go back to virtual instruction? Should our students go back to in-person instruction? Should our students go back to a hybrid model? Should our students wear masks? You know, should our students stay home? So there are all sorts of splits in opinion. And it's important that we are patient. We understand that we're all in this together. Schools still, even if we open now, has to be nurturing. It has to be caring and welcoming. And when we build this plan, I, my mind keeps going back to our kindergartners, our first graders, even sixth graders, ninth graders who are going to go back to school to a brand new building for the first time. And now it's nerve wracking to begin with. Now they're coming back in a different, completely alien type environment uh, where we have to operate with an instructional program during a pandemic. So we have to be nurturing, caring and welcoming and remember that that's our job, to care for kids. How can we reopen? So on the left hand side, you know, you'll see what are we aim for? Our goal was to open up five days a week in person and have students come in and we would teach and provide them a instructional experience to the best degree that we can. Initially, that's the intent of by far most of the districts. But I will tell you that it's becoming more challenging to implement. And many districts are starting to consider other alternatives. Just today, the city of Philadelphia decided and well, at least approved their plan and indicated they could not do five days per week in person. It just could not happen. And they are doing a blended or in-person virtual option, which is the other option that we are looking at. What should we think about in terms of blended A, B or in-person? It's increasingly becoming recommended. It blends the best of in-person instruction with improved virtual instruction. So when we say A, B, what do we mean by that? It means that school districts would set their uh, students up into cohorts. And typically that's decided upon on the basis of the first letter of your last name. So it could be A and L. If your last name begins with A to L, you come to school on Mondays and all the other students come on to school on Tuesdays. And the other group come back on Wednesdays. The other group come back on Thursdays. And when you're not there and when you're home, you're attending to virtual instruction or you're attending to work that was assigned to you. How that schedule plays out is uh, up to school districts to figure out. Some school districts are considering an AB blended option where uh, students come every other day. Some are considering where your students will come in Monday, Tuesday. Others would come in Thursday, Friday. Some are considering options where Wednesday schools closed. Other ones are considering options where Friday students do virtual. But the important piece with an AB in-person virtual just means that essentially your classrooms are cut at least in half and the school size, of course, the population would be a half of the size at any given time. Um, also put here, you know, we've been receiving some feedback. We have a dedicated website, feedback on reopening at pdsd.org. Uh, stakeholders are welcome to email you know, the comments to that. It's not a question and answer site, um, but it's a place for you to send your comments. I will continue to direct you know, parents to principals, um, but we want comments in there and, and we certainly read each and every one of them. We have a task force, uh, broke that up into different groups. Um, in fact, that group has been working extremely busy this you know, last few weeks, but particularly this week. Um, we've had a lot of cl cross collaboration discussions where you know, our teaching and learning group, which includes our principals, are talking with food service and facilities to make sure that we're coordinated. And this task force has a guided principles. Health and well-being of our students and staff have to be prior prioritized. I'm looking above my computer, our five keys to excellence posters up there. It says safe and supportive school is the second key. That needs to be our goal. We, we know we have to provide options for families because the needs and the circumstances of every family is different. So we're gonna do that. We're gonna empower parents to make the best decision that they possibly can make. We have to acknowledge a high degree of flexibility understanding and aim for in-person. If that's not ideal for students and staff, look at a blended model. If that's not ideal for students and staff, look at a virtual model. Where does this information come from, right? Uh, so it's, it's not driven by opinion. Uh, in fact, the school board is seeing this recommendation for the first time. It's not driven by preferences. It's driven by experts, Centers for Disease Control, Chester County Health Department, which serves Delaware County, the American Academy of Pediatricians, the Bucks County Department of Health, the World Health Organization, school guidance from the Pennsylvania Department of Education. This plan that will ultimately be approved on July 29th will be linked to some expert opinion or expert guidance that won't be just kind of based on the feelings or opinions of an administrator or school board member. It's all gonna be linked to expert suggestions, recommendations, and advice. These are our primary sources right there. 
philosophical foundations of what we do, hey, there's converging evidence that the coronavirus doesn't transmit among children like the flu, that it's a lower risk. Right? We have to be aware of that, right? We, we have to be aware it can't all be doom and gloom. The direction of transmission is adult children, and kids getting sick is on the order of rare. But we also advocate that all policy considerations should start with a goal of having students back present in school. And we should have coordinated interventions that intend to mitigate, but not eliminate risk, because we will never be able to fully admit to eliminate risk. Adult activities and experiences like PTL meetings, you know, maybe assemblies, you know, back to school nights, these things will have to be minimized so that we can maximize the opportunity for students to come into school every day or every other day and enjoy a learning experience. This is the first page of the plan uh, that's been sent to our school board. It's a draft plan. Uh, it's 46 pages, actually talks about uh, what we we'll commit to doing if we open, totally reopen every single day, or if we do a blended or hybrid operation. Um, that plan, again, will be pushed on our website and parents will certainly will be welcome to provide feedback on that plan. It's about 46 additional pages. It addresses custodial issues. It addresses issues about masking. It addresses health and safety. How will we communicate our information? That's the plan that in two weeks will be finalized and given to the board uh, for adoption based upon the feedback from the board and the community. Here's you know, our principles and rationale that are embedded throughout this plan. Uh, first of all, again, as we talked about our principles up top, guiding principles, we can move on. Screening. You know, so in other words, where do the ideas of screening, hygiene, masking, and distancing come from? Well, Gene Kasner, Chester County Department of Health. No students with symptoms or temperature are allowed at a bus or at school. No staff with symptoms or temperature are allowed at school. On-site temperature taking is not recommended because fever is not a consistent symptom in children and would re result in lines and delayed school entry. We strongly recommend parents and caregivers be empowered to do the screening of their students, of their children. Hygiene will be disinfecting at different intervals throughout the day with an emphasis on student and staff hand hygiene. We talk about American Academy of Pediatrics advice. We talk about Centers for Disease Control. Masking, people should wear cloth face coverings in public settings, especially when school distancing measures are difficult to maintain. Chester County Department of Health, and Dr. David Damsker from Bucks County. Buses can operate with a maximum of two students per seat with the understanding that masks are required while riding the bus. Governor's order, of course, everyone above the age of two must wear a mask. Distancing, refrain from scheduling large group activities such as field trips, intergroup activities, extracurricular activities. Target a minimum of three feet up to six feet of social distancing between students where feasible. And the World Health Organization has always said, Maintain three feet distance between yourself and others during this pandemic. Uh, the screening will, no matter what plan we have, staff and parents will be told what the list of look fors are to conduct those before students and staff come to school in the morning. If you're symptomatic, you're not permitted in our schools, you have to stay home. Uh, staff will report suspected concerns to a school nurse. School nurses will coordinate their contact with the Chester County Department of Health when they learn of positive or potential cases of COVID-19, and we will follow the directions and advice of the health department. We won't make those calls ourselves. Just the County Department of Health has given us guidelines to follow, right? If you have one of these items in Group A, you need to stay home, right? If you have some of the items in Group, two of the items in Group B, you need to stay home. If you have a temperature, an oral temperature of 100 or higher, you need to stay home. If you have Temporal take and temperature at 99.5, you need to stay home. Hygiene, so we've looked at our schedules. We have opportunities for more frequent hand washing and sanitizing. Sharing of items are gonna be avoided or cleaned and disinfected. Hand sanitizing stations have been purchased. They will be placed throughout our school. So you'll see more hand sanitizing stations throughout our school locations. We had already decided and thank you school board for uh, taking funds to purchase additional Chromebooks for the middle school. So grades six, seven, and eight, we have Chromebooks on order for those students that will definitely limit the technology sharing and also help for those students who will be at home and doing virtual learning. It's one less computer that, you know, siblings will have to fight over when they're home. And of course, we'll reduce the uses of common high touch items whenever possible. 
hand sanitizing stations. You know, we were encouraging all students, of course, to have you know their own personal water bottles with them. Uh, we we have refilling stations in most of our schools. Uh, they're very difficult to get at the moment. Uh, we're continuing to try to swap out some of our water fountains uh, to try to minimize that activity. But we want students to come in with, you know, a filled water bottle and we'll have water bottle uh, refilling stations an opportunity for kids to stay hydrated throughout the day. Distancing. So currently, we can say that all the classrooms can meet the World Health Organization for physical distancing and the CCHD, Center, Chester County Health Department requirement. We can do that. Large congregate areas such as the lunchroom and cafeteria, we're continuing to look at that. We have concerns, particularly at the secondary level, because it requires six foot of distance between students when they're not wearing masks. Of course, you can't wear a mask if you're eating your lunch. We have been told buses can run with a maximum of two per seat, masks are required, and siblings should be seated together. And then small group and one-to-one -one lessons should be minimized to the maximum extent. However, for those students who have uh, specially designed instruction and must work specifically maybe one-on-one -on -one with a speech therapist, for instance, we have some mitigation measures in place and some barriers to help uh, with the staff and the students who would be dealing with those distancing needs and still need direct instruction. We need to keep visitors out of school. Uh, large group activities that place kids together have to be eliminated. You know, so some of those kind of uh, fun assemblies, unfortunately, would be postponed or canceled. Um, we are guided to have students seated in the same direction, directional transitions in the hallway, and then reminders all over the place for our kids, because this is just not a normal practice. You know, you bring kids back together, they see their friends for the first time, they want to run up and give each other a high five and a hug, and they're excited to see one another, and that really shouldn't be happening during a pandemic. I'll give you an example of, you know, what this looks like in our classrooms, right? So here, here is a, a Northley classroom, and remember it's a summertime, so it's not all dressed out the way it normally would. On the left-hand side is a classroom that actually meets the requirements for reopening. That meets the requirements. But we need you to imagine all of those middle school students sitting there meeting the requirement with a mask on but not really moving around too much, right? You don't really see a lot of collaborative learning. You don't see sharing. It's, it's, a, it's, it's a tight situation. There's no question about it. On the right-hand side would be what the classroom would look like in a hybrid model, where half of the class would come in. And then we can obviously spread people out further. If they're beyond the six feet, students would be able to get a, a mask breather. Uh, the teachers would be able to roam the room uh, more easily. So that's the reality of the of this decision that we're looking at here. Here's another elementary classroom, right? And again, I would tell you that most of our classrooms don't typically look like that, right? A lot of uh, desks are put together. You have a lot of group work. Again, there's a lot of problem-based learning. It's not really a traditional, all the desks lined up in rows kind of scenario, but that's a scenario districts have to set up for now because all students have to go in the same direction. They can't be close. So you have a traditional look, but even with a traditional look, imagine that elementary class and the teacher comes in and those students are at those desks all day with a mask. Uh, we could do it. That's my point. We can do it. A hybrid model provides a little more flexibility. And you'll see on the right-hand side, if those students are there, we have the, a little more social distancing uh, permissible in, in that classroom. Cafeteria distancing is an issue. Uh, we're working through that. Um, and it's six feet for all students, not just for uh, secondary. And our administrators realize some students in order to accommodate may have to take lunch back into their classrooms. Activities means meetings, gatherings, they're canceled or postponed. Um, IEP meetings should be held virtually so that parents won't have to come into the school like we're, we're doing now. And some cherished annual school events may not occur. That's a reality that we have to get our heads around, you know, some things just are not going to occur this year like they typically would have. You know, we, it, homecoming is not that far off. It's possible we, we won't have homecoming this year. Masking is the next piece, right? The Centers for Disease Control Director uh, was unequivocal on this. To me, face coverings are the key. If you really look at it, the data is really clear. They work. CDC Director Dr. Robert Redfield says we're not defenseless against COVID. Cloth face coverings are one of the most powerful weapons we have to slow and stop the spread of the virus, particularly when used universally within a community setting. All Americans have a responsibility to protect themselves, their families, and their communities. 
So regardless of what model we open in, and students will be asked to wear a mask. So on the right-hand side is, uh, you know, some child-friendly masks. And we had an administrator who said, you know, we're talking about the problems of wearing masks with, with young kids, but maybe we can gamify it. You know, let, let's make it fun. Let's make it, you know, part of life where kids can say, this is fun. This, I got a cool Star Wars mask. So parents were encouraged to think about getting those kind of cloth masks that would be comfortable. On the left-hand side is our business manager who didn't have a choice but saying yes to my request to take this picture. Uh, you'll see a face shield that we purchased for all district employees. All district employees will be given a mask and will be given a face shield for their protection and for the protection of the students. And as you can see, teaching and operating with the face shield is much easier, right? You can actually see the face. You can see that they're happy. You can read the lips easier. It's, it's, it's a better product. We've made that purchase for every employee, whether you're a power educator, a custodian, or a teacher, we're gonna give that to you for your protection and for the protection of students. You can also wear their own personal cloth or not N95 mask, uh, you know, when they're not working in closer contact with students. We know that, you know, teachers at the secondary level, if they're at the front of the room and students are in the back of the room, you can have a mask breather because you have the necessary distance. Principals are looking at opportunities to schedule to get students in places where they can take a mask break with necessary distancing. And we are very, very understanding of the challenge that masks present for certain special needs students or very young children. We're, we are um, not forgetting the issues that this can propose. Transportation. So some of you may have seen this on social media. This is the latest school bus that's uh, being shopped around the school districts. This is a socially distant school bus, as you see. This enables us to bus all of our kids, uh, but they certainly wouldn't fit in our bus depot. Um, but aside from the joke, we looked very carefully at our buses and what would that look like if we followed the guidelines from the Department of Health? And you would look at this on the left-hand side and you'll see the blue spots where you can sit and the red spots where you can't sit. And what they're doing is essentially not forgetting that the people right in front of you would be more likely exposed by any respiratory airborne uh, material. So we're following the guidance. We're not making that up as we go. We also will be providing an opportunity for parents in, in the coming weeks to tell us if they will not be utilizing transportation. And by doing so, we will be able to get our bus uh, numbers of 81 students back down to likely below 50 and be able to provide transportation in line with the guidance. So we're gonna give you the opportunity to opt out. Uh, wearing a mask is a condition for transportation on the bus vehicle. And if kids don't wanna wear a mask, they would have to uh, find another way to get to school. You have to wear a mask if you want our bus transportation. We know that we may need additional time for arrival and dismissal period. So we'll be more flexible about that issue. And currently we do not expect that we would need additional buses to provide transportation. I know some districts out there talking about not providing transportation because they, they, they can't comply with the requirements. We can do it. And we think once we learn what students are being driven to school anyway, it's going to reduce our bus count, particularly at the secondary level. Food service, uh, if we ever had to slip back to virtual, we'll continue to offer lunch supports for qualifying families, just like we did during the pandemic. Uh, the lunch experience I've been talking a lot about, we have to think about that you know, for those students who are enduring lunch every day uh, with that six feet of separation, uh, that can be a challenge, right? Um, secondary students, they wanna hang out with their friends, they wanna have fun, they wanna crack jokes, they wanna laugh, they wanna breathe, or, this takes that away. Administrators are working up plans that in could include lunch in the classroom or the modified schedules. So a number of districts are also considering a grab and go option for lunch in which secondary students would be dismissed prior to lunch with the option to purchase a lunch or receive a lunch to go that they could eat at home. And that's again, because of this kind of solitary nature of lunch that could have to be held in cafeterias or gymnasiums. Uh, if we were to pursue that approach, we would consider an opportunity for a late morning healthy snack or kind of a refueling break, certainly for students who would kind of need some, some type of nutrition in the late morning hours to get them to that later lunch. That is currently not in the plan, but it's being considered and I'm bringing it to the board as an option for us to provide lunch in a socially distant environment. 
Uh, school district guidance recommends that facility use by external groups be limited to outdoor areas and fields, right? So why do we say parents can't come into school, but we can have guests and visitors and groups and booster groups and clubs and athletic groups coming into our building as soon as kids leave? Uh, guidance recommends that that be limited to outdoor areas and also required to submit a health and safety plan to utilize those facilities. We're looking at all of our cleaning and HVAC protocols against the CDC recommendations. We won't make it up. The cleaning and disinfecting supplies will be based on the approved list that we can use against COVID-19. But I, I'm going to stop for a moment and I'm going to just show you this picture, which was, I think, uh, in the New York Times this past weekend. Um, now, we're talking a lot about logistics. And I increasingly need us to think about kids, students first. So this apparently is an image from a school in California that is having summer school. I, those kids don't look real happy to me, I have to tell you. And um, it's very limited in the kind of instruction that any school district can provide in this model. So some school is better than no school, but let's keep in mind as we make a decision what our decision is going to have on an impact on kids who are going to have to be in our rooms for six hours a day, six plus a day, and the staff. And what can we do? You know, you don't see the kind of things we want to see in there. You don't see collaboration. You don't see communication. You don't see critical thinking, not too much. You certainly, you know, don't, maybe character. Maybe you see character because of the discipline of having to stay in your seats all day. But that's, you know, what American classrooms are going to have to tackle with in the next, you know, uh, upcoming months. So we can't forget the impact of this on kids, whatever decisions is made. Parent survey results from about a month ago, 60% uh, of the parents indicated that they were somewhat or extremely uncomfortable sending their children back if there was only minor restrictions. 31%, 31% said, you know what, Pendelco cyber virtual learning, that might be what my kid needs. Um, large, large majority of parents indicated no problem. I could send my, my kid to school with them, their own mask. That's not a problem. We will have backup masks, but you know, kids might want their own personalized one. I have 51 pages of additional open-ended feedback that the board will be uh, provided. Uh, it says, you know, there's mixed results. Some people thought the virtual learning was terrific. It was, their kids thrived in it. Others, no, it, it really didn't go well for their kids. And parents are concerned about the quality of the school experience. Our staff survey results, um, about half are concerned, you know, about the fact that they're gonna be teaching and living in districts that might have different schedules while advancing kind of legitimate questions. They're not just saying, we can't do it, forget it. You know, how are we gonna do this? You know, they're trying to come up with solutions that are good for the Pendelco community. So we're gonna have Pendelco Cyber available for certain. And Pendelco Cyber School is different than the experience that your child may have had last spring. Remember last spring, we had you know, a week or two of notice to all of a sudden shift from, in, from brick and mortar to cyber learning. That's not a lot of time. That wasn't like the 12 years that cyber schools had to try to put a program in place. We have a cyber program in place and we're going to offer that for parents because we want parents to stay with Pendelco because we know we can do virtual learning better than the cyber charters are doing where the results are nothing short of horrific. The graduation rates, are uh, down in the 20, 30 percentile. Their school performance profile scores are not good. We have parents who come back from cyber uh, charter schools. The kids are behind. Uh, they were not pleased with it. Uh, there was not enough interaction. We know we, we can do this, you know, and we, and we want the Pendelco family to remain the same. And we're offering Pendelco cyber for parents who want that option. And our students deserve better and they're gonna get better. You get a Sun Valley diploma if you do Pendelco cyber. You do Pendelco Cyber, you want to be on our sports team, you can be on our sports team. You want to be in our course? Well, if there was course, maybe this year is not a great, great, the best year for an example, but you want to be involved in extracurriculars in Pendelco and you still want to do those things with the friends in your neighborhood. You don't want to be in a cyber charter that, that's run out of Pittsburgh, Pendelco Cyber, and we'll be there for you. So what might be different, no matter what? Virtual back to school night presentation for parents, uh, that's almost a near certainty. IP meetings virtually. We talked about everything else being postponed or canceled. Uh, secondary late bus runs will be canceled because we have no way to guarantee that we're going to have you know the right seating. Uh, they were not utilized very often to begin with. 
in-person group shows and performances restricted. Uh, there will be limitations on attendance at athletic competitions that may occur. Uh, we'll have uh, drop-off stations outside of our schools. Parents have to drop off a lunch for a student, perhaps, or they forgot, you know, a book bag. They'll be able to put it in a drop-off station outside. They won't have to come into the office and get into the building. We want to cohort students when possible so the students stay the same. So if we ever had to do contact tracing, it's easier to do. Our student school supply lists uh, will change. They'll be designed to limit the sharing of items. And some extracurricular activities will also be canceled or postponed. What's uncertain is lunch, uh, the number of students who might request virtual instruction, number of students who may not utilize Pendelco transportation, you know, this cycle, and then the implication of the governor's order on masking. What is certain, the experience is gonna be different. Whatever plan or approach we select will be criticized and unpopular because we are not gonna be able to satisfy such a wide range of opinions and interests and circumstances. What's certain is the social emotional health, the mental health of our students has to be closely monitored to make sure that this is good for them. And, and what's certain is that the best thing we could do is normalize life for them right, to the greatest extent possible. You know, we can't have them looking back at this period of time and it being a bleak time. We have to try to normalize it. So I've been telling my administrators, start where you are, use what you have and do what you can do. And that's our approach. We're starting where we are, we're using what we have and we're gonna do what we can do. We're gonna do it to the best of our ability. We will continue to engage with the task force, staff, parents via surveys. Last night I had a Zoom with PTL officers. It was extremely helpful. This afternoon and Monday afternoon, I had a Zoom with about 40 staff members and teachers for feedback, extremely helpful. Uh, we'll continue to work on alternate schedules and plan possibilities for the school board. We are looking to procure additional substitute staff for all of our departments, knowing that we can expect a likelihood that there will be an increased absentee rate. Uh, we will maintain this regular series of updates to the community, most particularly to the board over the next two weeks on our reopening plan. And then ultimately I will offer Zoom meetings with stakeholder groups in mid to late August to really talk through some of these things and answer some of the more specific questions that people will have at that time. Here's the options for the board, everyday in-person instruction and the option for parents to enroll their children in Pendelco Cyber or proceed with a hybrid option, which would reduce group size and the stress possibly of complying with required accommodations. Uh, we will post the initial plan draft, uh, it's in draft form right now. As I said, it's about 50 pages uh, for the website. Uh, and if anyone wants to offer public feedback, they can. Uh, from the 16th to the 20th, we're gonna continue to work with administrators to talk about the implications and the proposals of these alternate plans. A uh, big week next week, right? We're gonna have a survey for parents regarding their transportation plans, survey regarding uh, their preference in school every day under those circumstances or at home every other day under those circumstances. We'll refine the plan, we'll bring it back to the board with justifications, additional interventions, July 29th, school board approves its reopening plan. And then we start our community notification so that we can get information out to parents so they have a month to plan for our uh, September 8th start, whether that is in person, whether that's virtual, whether that is a blend of both. Won't go through all this, it's running late, but it's a great important point. It's not really about how the school's safe for reopen. It's in the end, this is gonna come down to what happens in our community. It all comes down to community transmission. If community transmission stays low enough, we can get back to normal. But if community transmission doesn't stay low and if people don't follow the guidelines and recommendations, this cycle is never gonna end. So we need community transmission to stay low so we can get back to normal. Um, no matter what, there are screening protocols that we will follow. I mentioned some of those already. There are hygiene protocols that we're following. We're purchasing electrostatic cleaners, for instance, uh, disinfecting of buses, right? The high touch areas, we'll have a clean crew that's gonna run through. We're looking to ask the staff, for, uh, the board for additional staff that we can have uh, some temporary part-time workers to come in and actually help us have another wave of cleaning in our buildings. We'll be telling kids, you know, got to stop the handshakes, the fist bumps, all those kind of things. So our masking precautions that we're going to follow, there's no question about it. The distancing is a really big issue. 
it's a really big issue and it's hard because we are a social creature and that's what we do in schools right we serve kids and we are we're not distant beings when we teach you know kids collaborate and they learn how to work together classroom configurations are being altered as we speak or maybe not as we speak but certainly this week so that we can look at that physical distancing and we'll have that set up for our staff when they come back um, you know, our expressive arts specialists and teachers, they may have to travel to the classroom rather than having students head out. And that'll help us with contact tracing if we need to get to that point. It'll also help us mitigate potentially any spread that could happen. We're telling all of our staff they have to enter using their scan cards so that we know who was in and who was out. Um, folks have said, you know, if someone has COVID, you know, would we get to know who it is? Um, well, no, we, we, we have to maintain confidentiality while still ensuring that parents and staff are informed if they may have been exposed to COVID-19. Um, the use of outdoor spaces, absolutely. That's something that we're gonna to try to use as often as we can. We should be prepared for this to run into the winter or rainy days and recognize it's not always option. That's on a reopening plan. But while I have everybody's attention, just quickly, a couple other matters. Uh, the Sun Valley uh, Entrance and Nurses Suite project is uh, going along pretty well. Uh, you'll see on the left uh, what the new entrance will look like, much more aesthetically pleasing. It'll be much brighter. That was always a very kind of dark area. It was difficult to clean. There were some structural challenges to it as well because of the age. You'll see on the right-hand side progress that we're making there. It's going to have you know, really a, a nice statement that we need to have for Sun Valley High School. Uh, we're working out the uh, color scheme as well so that that will attempt to match the browns and the tans that are in that building. So we, we want it to look like it was always part of that building and you'll see the rendering that really gives you that feeling. It also matches the other work that we did at Northley Middle School at Parkside, you know, some of the other improvements that we've done. And then below that is um, the new nurse's suite, uh, which is desperately needed at the high school. Um, I'm told that's ahead of schedule. It doesn't look like it is, but it, I'm told that's ahead of schedule. For, and remember we were talking about an early winter opening there uh, but you'll see the foundation set and folks say, where is that? That's where there used to be a little grass, grassy patch right off of the uh, courtyard in front of the high school. And that grassy patch is there, but the student courtyard still remains. I also wanted to share that, you know, uh, the planning uh, for a startup of a Pendelco Diversity, Equity and Inclusion Committee, you know, that continues. Um, that was something we just put on the agenda last month and nothing's going to happen. Um, but right now that is uh, taking backseat to the work that we're doing to reopen schools, but we are targeting an initial meeting date after the school begins and that will likely uh, be done virtually as well um, and a few appendices. So I appreciate the time. I'm sure there's a lot of questions uh, and you know, I, I will yield my time to the school board and see if uh, I can answer anything or my team can answer any questions. At a minimum, let us know what other information you will need. Let me stop the sharing. Thank you, Dr. Steinhoff. Uh, there are several questions in the chat. We will get to them when we get to the public comments section of the meeting. Um, we will address them. The agenda is very short, um, so that we should be getting to them very uh, soon. If anyone else would like to ask a question in reference to um, the agenda, maybe please raise your hand and you will give, be given time to speak. Uh, we'll address the questions that have come in already uh, to the best of our knowledge. Um, things are ever changing throughout uh, every day. Um, so we're taking the advice of the, the professionals of the world and uh, we'll be moving forward with that. So with that uh, announcement for the public, tonight the uh, board met in executive session to discuss personnel and litigation matters. Um, comments by members of the board. Do any board members have comments? Yeah, uh, Mr. Armour, I had a couple of questions. This is a good time to, so a couple of questions on the reopening plan. Thanks, George, for, that's a lot of detail and I'm sure there'll be a ton more questions, but um, just one of the things on, on top of mind is, if we do go with a cyber and hybrid approach, can students move in and out of those depending on their success at each of those? Do you envision that to be an option? 
So what I would tell you is uh, the cohorting piece is really important, right? So once we say you're in the A, A team, so to speak, or you're in the B team, so to speak, you know, we'll certainly want students, if they go every other day, you know, to stay with that group, right? So if someone, heaven forbid, was uh, positive, we wouldn't be impacting the whole school, it would only be half of the cohort. For people who though choose, you know, Pendelco Cyber, again, which is different than every other day virtual, right? This is Pendelco Cyber means every day I'm doing virtual. At the moment, if parents say, you know, a month into that, this isn't working well for my child, I want to go back, you know, into the into a program, um, then that option, you know, would be available. We we have to evaluate the impact of a, a student in cyber versus in person, right? And the impact of that change, you know, on the environment. Um, but I, I don't want to be at a spot, you know, where a parent says, I'm afraid to pick Pendelco Cyber if my kid can't back, come back to school until, you know, second semester. We want to try to be very flexible with people. But what we can't uh, permit would be someone to say every two weeks, you know, I changed my mind. I don't want to do cyber anymore. I changed my mind. That's not fair to teachers or to the students. Uh, got it, George. And when we talk about the cohorts, I read a little bit, bit, bit about the Philadelphia plan that they came out this morning. I know they really heavily focused on, uh, you know, those students with, with complex needs that really virtual learning is not going to be an option. Are we going to heavily have them more in a face-to-face -face environment and have them less minimized in a virtual environment? Do you see that being being the plan? Yes. So I, I would say the more complex the needs of a child, the greater the flexibility and support we're going to provide. So in a lot of a lot, in many of those cases, uh, their program is governed by a, an IEP that we have to meet those requirements anyway. Uh, but we're sensitive to the fact that we could potentially open our buildings every day for students in low incident populations or multi-disabilities, knowing that they're in a room of maybe three or four others. So we, we can you know, say with confidence that there's a lot of social distancing going on and we have a staff to be able to provide the kind of environment that they need. And we also know that some of those students just do not learn well in a purely virtual model. Um, and I think everybody understands that. So I would say for, you know, any parents who are concerned about their students who might have significant academic or emotional needs, we would work with them individually to come up with the best option for them. Some have already said, you know what, I don't think my child will operate well in this environment. I want to stay home. I, I want virtual learning for my child. And again, that's where our flexibility comes in. Uh, we're going to honor, you know, to the best degree we can, you know, family, family choice. And, uh, and and try to assist in that in that process. Good deal. Thanks, Jordan. And one last for me. And I'll, I'll I'll let everyone else jump in. But any word on uh, Delaware County Technical uh, Technical School and the Votech program for the fall? Any word on that yet? Yes. Thanks for asking. So I just received an email uh, from Mr. Butts, who is the uh, new director of DCTS. Uh, he contacted Mr. Sassy as well today and sent an update. I will tell you that I haven't been able to read his complete plan. Um, but in the email, it said, you know, we intend to open. We understand we have to provide in-person instruction. We understand that, you know, auto body repair is something that you can't do virtually, right? So their plan, uh, they've spent the time to, you know, try to figure out how they can open up their programs every day for students. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions about the board? Yeah, if it's okay. Can I, uh, can I go as well? Sure. So one, I appreciate this, George. I wrote, I'm a visual learner, so I have all these posted notes. I appreciate the plan. Um, again, you know, we have probably one of the largest attendees for the, um, at a school board meeting. So related to that, exactly what I said, not many people might've been on the first time I said this to you, what happened in March, did not uh, did not ever happen before. Meaning, you were never at a, a workshop or a conference for superintendents. None of the teachers went to any teachers conference related to this. So, what we're doing is just not winging it. Just using for what we know today. What you knew Friday, March thirteenth, is heck of a lot different than what you know July fifteenth. Um, so we have 
three meetings. We have July 29th, August 8th, August 19th, and then August 26th. What you saw, George, what you saw Dr. Steinhoff publish tonight or communicate tonight could be totally different what we see in, in six weeks. You, you saw what Pennsylvania, or I'm sorry, what Philadelphia said yesterday, and you saw what Pennsylvania said today. So at least we have a plan in place. So I, I guess just we're, we're going to ans ask as many questions, and I'm sure there's going to be even some other additional questions that maybe we never thought of. One that came to mind is, I didn't see that, George, so I don't know if it's the CDC, is the temperature limit. Is there a temperature limit that for when students come into the schools? Is it 100.3, 100.4? I can I can answer that from a from my perspective. I believe it is 100.4 is a cutoff limit. Um, Dr. Steinhoff, can you chime in there? Is that is that what we're so if a child, if you check your child's temperature in the morning and it's above 100.3, that uh, you should not send your child to school. And if you were a um, an employee of the district, that would uh, be as well. Yeah, I believe it's actually a little lower than that. And that's the kind of documentation that we'll put out for parents. So there's no question about it. You know, what do you need to do for a symptom check? And it'll be very clear if your child's temperature is this high, your child has to stay home. And that's again, the number that comes out the Chester County Department of Health is given to all the school districts. Thank you. Yes, yeah, sure. And it also depends on the, the type of temperature that uh, check that you take. I saw that, and I don't know if Mr. Rafford is on. So I saw even today that from the PIAA. So I know football has been practicing at least from that for the heat acclimation that's still as of right now august 10th and as of today all other fall sports on the 17th of august that's correct we still have the summer program <clears throat> programming going on um you know there, there's rumors about fall sports nothing has been official so uh our school district like every other school district in pennsylvania is permitted to uh let students do athletic uh, summer activities following the athletics health and safety plan that the board approved last month. Uh, I, you know, I have some parents who ask that question, how can we be talking six feet distancing, um, but yet you've got kids out there doing athletics. Um, you know, we have our students out doing athletics because they're permitted to do so. And uh, you know, what the fall season looks like, uh, that has not yet been determined, uh, but we're not gonna inhibit the kids from doing something if they're permitted to do it and they could do it safely. Uh, Mr. Rafferty has been going out to practices to make sure that people are distancing, that there's no kind of small group, tight group work. Uh, I saw a group the other morning. I was very impressed with what they were doing on the field. Everybody was separated. Everyone's doing their calisthenics. So they're doing what we expect them to do. Um, we'll, we'll have to wait and see what the fall brings. Yeah, because as of 5 p.m. tonight, PIAA communicated their exact words are moving forward with the start of the fall sports season. Obviously that could change in the next week or two, but I believe that's as of right now, that's the direction from that. Um, another one is, and then um, is that technology. So we kind of, we started talking about this. So we know that there was not Pendelco's fault, but there was issues week one, week two, sometime in March related to Schoology, whether it was a server, they weren't used to the, the heavy traffic, as well as our traffic that uh, we have. So what are you gonna, what are some of the steps we are taking moving forward on that? Sure, yes, the first couple of weeks of uh, virtual was really, there were a lot of hiccups and that was primarily due to Schoology. So some parents may have even gotten the emails from Schoology that said we're working on it or they would get error messages. And that was because of the uh, extreme overload that Schoology was experiencing. So once Schoology managed that, and I give them credit for doing it in pretty short order, at least the continuity of it was better um, in terms of the, its availability was higher. Uh, what has happened since then is continued training in that, in that platform. Um, as you know, Mr. Gorniak is now the manager of blended and virtual learning. So he's continuing to work to refine that. Our curriculum department is continuing to work to make sure that our virtual offerings are better. Um, you know, we've looked at other options. You know, it's interesting. Um, I know people who use Canvas. They say Canvas is horrible. I wish we had Schoology. 
we use Schoology. Some people say Schoology is horrible. I wish we had Canvas. I think there's limitations to every platform that's out there. Um, we will get better with Schoology as parents see it more and our kids use it more and our staff use it more. So just using the program itself is going to, I, I think, create some enhancements and some improvements. Um, our staff is also uh, being given the opportunity to write digital curriculum this summer so that the curriculum itself will be more robust. Um, in terms of technology access, you know, as, as I said, we're mentioning, we are purchasing more Chromebooks than we'll inventory and we'll see how many we have. Our hope would be to work our way down from fifth down to first in terms of assignment of devices, because we know for parents that was difficult. You know, parents who had two or three kids in a, in a three or four even, you know, uh, children in the family and then uh, only one computer, you know, that, that was a real hardship. And they all would be home on the same day under a hybrid model. So we're aware of that as well. Um, the challenge, and I'll tell the board this, you know, straight up is, you know, it, it always comes back to finances. So Pendelco has the second lowest amount of revenue per pupil in Delaware County. So we, we have to be very efficient with what we do. There's only one district that spends less per pupil than, than us. So we, we just can't go out and say, let's just, let's just buy 3,400 Chromebooks. We really have to be judicious about how we spend the, spend the funds that we have. But it's clear that getting a device in every child's hand is absolutely not the distance future, but the near future. Sorry, and I might open up more questions. One of them, one other comment. Sorry, Mr. Arner. Is you made a comment or the presentation. You talked about um, the time from the bus, how it's going to take longer. We know getting on the bus is going to be longer, come, potentially coming off, going into all the classrooms. So this might be yourself or if Mr. Kamenka as well. How is that going to change the duration of the day? Sake of argument, I know it's eight some eight fifty something each particular schools and high schools. Does it look like you're going to chip away at each classroom time if you were going to go full time in the classroom? Yeah, if we were going full time, uh, what, I mean, it would just it would mean that there's less instructional time, and the state has given school districts the ability to apply. Uh, for that exemption because they know we're all going to need it. So it, in other words, it might mean that first period doesn't begin as promptly as it did in previous years. It might mean that the end of the day starts, comes sooner than it did in previous years. Like we know we can't say, all right, well, at this time we're letting all of our kids out. And now you've got, you know, several hundred elementary kids all dismissing at the same time. So the process of dismissal itself is going to take longer. So that will mean that the amount of time that we have attending to instruction is going to be squeezed a little bit, but that's going to have to take a second step to, you know, the priority of, of, of getting kids in school and dismissing them safely. Yeah. And that goes to, to one of it goes into comments. One is the, oh, the new normal meaning let's be honest. I think everyone, you know, with give or take we're almost that close to 500 going to the grocery store, for a case of seltzer water is heck of a lot longer now than it was six months ago. Um, so it's going to be, you would assume that, okay, well, what you needed five minutes is going to take you 15, 20 minutes. So that's the exactly what you said in your presentation with the new normal. So we got to take that in the fact. And then I also just want to make that little snide bit. I remember Dr. McGloin, when she was even, we were starting to do the virtual at one point, um, so years ago, it makes me feel how old I am. Um, I just want to make that little comment as far as for the cyber. We do have a, a Pendelco cyber and, and we've worked extremely hard, exactly what you said, to keep them, keep them in, in our school district. Um, so I just wanted to make that extra push. Thank you. That's all I have. Yeah. Thank, thank you, Mr. Tinsley. You know, the, the issue with cyber is difficult because there's so much misinformation out there. You, you drive up 95 and you see a giant billboard and it says tuition free virtual education. Well, it's not tuition free, right? So if a special needs student from Pendelco goes to Cyber Charter, we need $31,000 of taxpayer money to pay for that child to go to a Cyber Charter. So that means 10 homes, pick any 10 homes, their average tax bill, 10 of them go to pay for one child who would go to a virtual Cyber Charter school that isn't even located anywhere near us. And 
the, the fact that the public, the taxpayers, have to pay for that choice that somebody has is something I can't get my head around. If a parent chooses to send their children to private school, O'Hara or a Catholic school, that's their choice. They don't turn around and say, I want the Pendelco taxpayers to pay for my kid to go to a private school. They understand that's a choice. So it's difficult for me to understand how our taxpayers are being asked to pay $15,000 for a child to enroll in a cyber charter school with horrific results. And I can tell you that because I was on a board of a cyber charter. I could tell you all about it. Or even $31,000 that should go to support the schools of our hometown. And th there's no question there has to be cyber charter reform. We cannot have uh, cyber charters out there advertising that's tuition free. It's not tuition free. Our taxpayers, our senior citizens are paying for those programs. And we offer the same thing. We offer the same thing. So it just shouldn't be, it shouldn't be happening. And I know Mr. Armour has been talking to some of the local legislators about that uh, who, who understand the challenges that we're facing. So thank you for bringing up the issues of cyber. Thank you for bringing that up, Mr. Tinsley. Uh, as Dr. Steinhoff said, um, you know, we do have a very um, adequate online learning platform in the uh, Virtual Learning Academy through Pedelco. Um, that was started a few years back, just uh, last month at the board meeting. We approved um, uh, Chris Gorniak to take on that and uh, spearhead it. So we have a lot more attention to it. Um, depending upon the amount of uh, enrollment we have for this year will depend upon how many teachers we need to move from possibly from the classroom to virtual learning or possibly even uh, pick up some more teachers if needed. Um, but what Dr. Steinhoff was saying is, you know, it costs us anywhere from twenty dollars to $30,000 to outsource a, um, a cyber charter when we have it in-house and can do it ourselves. And that's something that the the taxpayers would have to uh, take on. So for those who are interested in the virtual learning platform of Cyber Charter, uh, we do ask to give that you give our uh, our cyber platform a, a try. Um, it is adequate. It is uh, just as good, if not better, than uh, than those uh, cyber charter programs out there. And I, I might be a little bit biased on that, but uh, I would feel completely comfortable having my child go through it if that was my choice to uh, the platform to use. Any other comments? All right, items for board information, uh, 6.01. Leon, Leon, sorry, I yes. just had a couple. Um, I just had a couple um, questions here. So, um, sorry. So if a patient, no, sorry, I'm going to work patient, a student or and or a teacher or facility, somebody who's working in there in the school if they become COVID positive, what is the protocol? Like, are they quarantined for two weeks? Do they have to get have to get tested and provide a negative test before they come back, or is it just a two week, um, no symptoms to coming back? And and is there going to be some type of notification for those that maybe were at a at a potential risk? Is there going to be notification um, going out to other staff and students that may have been around that positive? Yeah, I'll, I'll let Ms. Tyre address it a little bit uh, as well because she is intimately involved in this as our HR director. Um, but in any of those situations, you know, where someone may have been in contact or we find out somebody does have COVID, uh, what is the process? We have uh, flow charts that we follow that to see, uh, Chester County provided to the school district. Take out that flow chart, we follow the steps, and it almost immediately takes us to notifying Chester County Department of Health for guidance on next steps. And then they will initiate the efforts in coordination with the district on contact tracing and notification to individuals who, who may have been in contact with that person. But I think those kind of, they are the kind of questions that we also want to ultimately give to parents so they go into the school year not wondering, well, what will happen if there's a kid in the class who has COVID? We'll have frequently asked question sheet to kind of walk them through that so they get an understanding of what can I expect if that actually happens. I'll turn it over to Ms. Tyre, um, who's really been involved in this with other HR directors. Just, if I could say one thing real fast, just so uh, the attendees in the meeting, some may be asking why we keep referencing the Chester County uh, Department of Health. Uh, they do serve as the liaison for uh, 
Delaware County as we do not have that here in Delaware County. So that's why we keep referencing Chester County Department of Health um, and their guidelines, just to clarify that for you. Uh, just to follow up with what Dr. Steinhoff shared, if a student is um, become sick or is ill, is suspected to have COVID or has COVID, that will be processed through the nurse's office and the nurse will be in contact with the Chester County Department of Health. If an employee is um, suspected of having COVID or has COVID, they will come through the HR department and I would then be in contact with the Chester County Department of Health and they will really be leading the district on what next steps have to be taken and what information they may need for contact tracing um, and, and they'll be guiding, guiding that process. Thank you. Um, and then another thought um, that came through, so for backpacks, you know, I know this is at middle school at one point, you know, we said that there was no pet backpacks, but during the school, you know, cause that could be another point of transmission. Um, we'll, have we thought about the backpack policy throughout all schools and not just, you know, Northley? Yes, we have. Um... So it's not as much of an issue for the uh, elementary where the backpacks are coming in and they have cubbies. We do know the elementary principals are already working at making sure that uh, there's not contact, you know, particularly in the wintertime, those areas. And a lot of kids bring their coats in and it, get, it gets pretty compact in there. So they're already thinking through the logistics of what they have to do. Um, it's more of an issue at the middle school, right, where there's always this backpack issue and how much you know, things kids have to carry around. So Mr. Olucius, this is not a final plan, but he is looking at an option of providing kind of like a, a drawstring bag for the students uh, to have. So they'll be able to come in the morning, they'll be able to put their stuff in the locker and they won't have to continue to go in and out of the lockers all day long in other high touch areas. He's looking at working with the staff in terms of reducing the amount of things that kids have to take around. And certainly if they have Chromebooks and if they arrive prior to the start of school year, more of that content will be digital and they won't have to carry around as many textbooks. So uh, a, a great question. I just talked to Mr. Lucius about that two days ago and he's trying to think that think through that because we know for middle school kids, I mean, you know, sometimes they walk around with their whole locker in their hand all day long and uh, right. we, we want to minimize that. It also gives them a place for them to put their uh, antibacterial sanitizer that they might have or an extra mask or something like that they might have. That gives them a place to put that for the day. Thank you. I think that's it for me. Sure, you're welcome. My apologies. Is that it uh, for questions from the board? All right, so items for board information 6.01. Uh, was the first reading for adoption of the revised policy 1.03 uh, non-discrimination slash discriminatory harassment for school and classroom practices uh, just the first reading tonight um, i see we have a lot of public comments in the chat as well as a few hands raised um, would there be any public comments in reference to uh, any agenda items for tonight um, you're Probably best to put it in the chat box. It'll come at the bottom and we can pay attention to that to make sure uh, we can we can address those first. Uh, this is not the public comment section that we have for um, all questions. That comes at the end uh, later in the meeting. Probably about three minutes. All right, so we see as none for a couple of public comments in the beginning. Um, number nine is 9.01 personnel starts on page two, carries on to page three, uh, references the Penduckle budget 2019-2020, Act 93 plans, PDEA agreement, PDESPA agreement, PDSSPA agreement, the PA school code section 1108B. It is administration recommendation to approve all personnel items as presented. Do I have this motion? So moved. Second. Questions or comments? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion passes. So this is the section of the meeting where we will go with public comments. Um, I will ask that anyone who has not already posted a comment in the chat, please raise your hand. We will go through the uh, the chat. I'll read the, I'll read it 
um, and we will answer to the best of our knowledge through either uh, uh, Dr. Steinhoff, HR, or anyone of that. So Kelly Holcomb did ask, uh, how will students with 504s and IEPs transfer to virtual learning? Uh, I believe that'll probably be something for um, Mr. Kaminka. So we would do that through the IEP process or 504 process. Uh, we'd be able to have a meeting, team meeting, just like we would in, for in a uh, brick and mortar format. And any of the accommodations and um, uh, I, I guess adjustments that would have to be made or support that the student would need would transfer into the uh, virtual environment as well. So that would be based on a team meeting and it would be done with the parents, obviously virtually as we would try to maintain virtual meetings, um, but that would be done with the building principal, teachers involved, as well as the family. All right, thank you very Mr. much. Mr. Ar sorry, um, I just had an epiphany. I don't know if it's for now, but whether it's somebody with administration or, or so on, can we collect potentially FAQs? I, I get it, whatever's what happened now might not have to be, might not be worth published. Like, Dr. Steinhoff, it might be even worth it to have something prior to beginning of school year, a list of all these FAQs. And I, I get it that whatever we put on will change, but that might be, that question that was asked might not be the only person who has it, who has that question. So I don't Agreed. know if you, were, if you were even thinking of having an FAQ section on the website eventually. Yeah, we, uh, we absolutely are already starting to build that. And we have a dedicated section on the website. All these resources will be on, the presentation will be on, FAQ. Uh, when we have the material on how to enroll in cyber, that'll be on there as well. So yes. Thank you, Dr. Steinhoff. Thank you, Dr. Stein. So Stephanie Fitzgerald asked, how will water bottle refill stations be cleaned after each child because their bottles will be unsanitary due to oral secretions being present without being seen to the naked eye? Any questions with respect to, you know, the cleaning process? So we, we have the CDC guidelines that we're going to follow, the training that is provided for all of our facilities. So, you know, there, there is, you know, any number of questions that, that, well, what if this happens or how does this happen? Uh, because, again, it's all unknown and it's all new. All those items we're going to work on, we're just going to follow the guidelines from uh, the facilities department and from the CDC school cleaning guidelines to address those and not make them up as we go. Thank you, Dr. Stonewall. Uh, Amanda asked, will face shields be acceptable in place of cloth masks for students, I assume she is referring to? Yeah, the, the, the guidance for schools is that students should have a face covering on. So if they felt that a face shield was better, you know, it, it, it provides the same protection, something that we'll, we'll keep an eye on. Uh, but up to this point, the guidance has been you should have a face covering. And a mask is a covering, a shield is a covering, cloth covering, all those things. You've got a face covering that will stop the respiratory spread. Thank you. Um, how will the, the current attendance policy be enforced? Will there still be same limits on days out? Some of that is to be determined. You know, I think the state is, is grappling with the reality uh, that this is going to be a different year. Uh, right now, there are truancy laws that we have to follow and we're going to implement. Um, but there's also a level of reasonability that we that all school districts are going to have to follow. You know, the one thing we have to make sure is that students are accountable for the work this year. Um, a lot of districts, they understood that last spring was a, a challenging time. Um, and, you know, in a lot of places, those students, particularly at the secondary level, they went too long, you know, attenuating with the school district. And our teachers and our administrators spent time just trying to track kids down. Uh, so you have to log on. I mean, and, and when we reopen, whether it's hybrid, virtual, or every day, it's every day. It's every day you go to school. It's not, well, I go to school on Monday and then I'm off for a couple of days. I don't have to do any work. No, we, we expect you to, to be logged in and be working every day. And if you're not, we will record it as an absence. Thank you, Dr. Steinhoff. Um, Brittany asks, will they have to wear masks under the shields? I uh, do not believe that would be required. Uh, if a shield is on, that would be sufficient. Is that correct, Dr. Sano? That's what we understand. You know, we'll continue to look at that. And, um, you know, we'll have that guidance for parents before the start of the school year. But up to this point, face covering is sufficient. It doesn't have to be both. A lot of people want both. They want that extra layer. So that could happen as well. 
so not possibly not required, but definitely could be. Um, we have a question. Will this PowerPoint be made available so we can show it to our kids? Also for the adults, is a 64 page proposal going to be made available? That was from Chuck McKenna. Uh, yes, the PowerPoint will be up. And yes, the uh, I would say most of that uh, draft plan uh, will be up as it develops. We'll put it online so that you know, the public is, a, is aware of what the board will be voting on on July 29th. Thank you very much. Uh, Nicole Harris asks, why is three foot distance in a classroom environment deemed acceptable, but six foot for cafeteria? I think I can give a little insight to that. Uh, cafeteria, they're not able to wear a face mask or shield. They have to eat, um, can't eat through a face mask. So uh, the six foot in a classroom is acceptable without a face mask. If they're within six feet, they have to wear face coverings and should be three foot. So uh, hopefully that answered your question, Nicole. So, or Nicholas, I apologize. Um, but that's the reason for the cafeteria. They have to be able to uh, have access to their face. Uh, another question about the face shields, we already answered that. Um, Kate Bugalow, have you considered keeping elementary class lists the same instead of regrouping? It would cut down on the kids getting to know each other if that happened to have to start in a virtual environment. Uh, we have not, you know, I mean, our, our principals built the upcoming classes uh, based on the fact that everybody would come back, so they might be different. Um, we'll share that option with them. Um, so I understand that th those, those students, if we were to stay on virtual, they all know each other from the previous year, you know, Zooming with one another. So we'll share that with the principals. But at, this, at the moment, we haven't built our classes around that concept. Thank you very much, Dr. Steinhoff. Uh, Brittany asked, what if someone tests positive, will subs be allowed in different buildings? Um, I think we already addressed that. We have a protocol that we have to follow through the uh, Chester County um, Health Department. Um, Christy Shelley asked, can children wear face shields? We already covered that. Uh, Jamie Reeves, if a student returns to school and a student other teacher comes infected with COVID-19, uh, once again, we have just uh, addressed that. We have a, a flow chart that we have to follow. Um, we do need to, any positive cases have to be immediately reported. And, uh, and then we have to follow the guidelines. They could be ever changing. What they are today could not be what they are when we do open school. Uh, let's see. Jamie Reeves also asks, if schools reopen, how would it work with those kids who are special needs and have major health issues? Yeah. Our uh, school nurse, our school nurse, our uh, special education supervisors, potentially special education teachers, already have a relationship with those families. That'll continue, and we recognize it's going to be very unique accommodations for some of our students. And there will be wide ranges of flexibility, wide ranges of understanding, and we'll do our very best to meet the uh, required accommodations that are specified in the IEP. It's been a challenge, you know, for, for some of our I've students. Been dealing with a lot more than that. Not been able to operate as well virtually. So we'll continue to work with them in that regard. Of the drama. Lisa, can you uh, mute your? Got it. Thank you. All right, uh, Meg Greenway said, "Will there be a count of students that do not want to move to online learning before the decision on hybrid models? The count may make five days, days a week possible for the parents that do want to go back to school full full person." Uh, we did speak about this a little bit. Uh, I'll let Dr. Steinhoff chime in. It's a little too early to, but if could be a possibility, I guess is is my answer. Um, and I'll let Dr. Steinhoff speak on that. But we did speak about it. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry, and I didn't hear the question, Mr. Armour. Okay. So the question is: uh, Are we going to keep account on the students that want to move to online totally? Um, Therefore, if that count is high enough, we still may be able to do five day a week in person and socially distance the kids, depending upon how many kids we have. I under, now I understand the question. Yes, there, there are some districts, I know at least of one district in Delaware County that is waiting to find out how many parents choose virtual learning. Because if they choose virtual learning, then the possibility is that everybody else would be able to come in every day. Um, however, the, the challenge that they're finding with that is your staff, though, would be asked to do two things simultaneously, virtual teaching 
and also teach the kids that are in front of them. Um, so could it change based on the numbers of students that elect virtual? Uh, it could. Um, my sense from talking to parents is that we wouldn't have that many. And you know, the initial survey talked about a third being interested. I think as we get closer, school districts are finding it's really kind of closer to 10 to 15 percent. And if, even if we had that number, that's 300 students. So we would be more inclined to stick with the hybrid model because of the cohorting and because of the experience for kids that are there. Uh, but we would have to really see a substantial drop in classroom sizes right now. So, and even, you know, if we look at some of the high school classes, like an AP section, you could have an AP psych section of 28 students because we have one AP psych teacher. So imagine, you know, trying to teach that class and physically distance. That's where the hybrid model comes in and starts to make a little more sense. Thank you. Uh, ben asked, to minimize the risk during lunch, can students be sent home to have their lunch then return to school? Um, as we stated earlier, Dr. Steinhoff was looking at a lot of different op options, um, possibly even sending uh, students home uh, right before lunch. Uh, obviously, you know, maybe maybe running school through one o'clock, having a, a snack time, sending the kids home with their lunch or to eat lunch to stay home for the rest of the day. Um, I don't necessarily think we will be transitioning kids home for lunch and then back to school. I'm not saying that that's ruled out, but your thoughts on that, Dr. Stonel? Yeah, well, was, was some of those uh, kind of common sense solutions start to potentially run afoul of the requirements that we have uh, as a uh, provider of the national uh, lunch program. So in that regard, we, we could potentially have to run two things, let some kids go home and, and then run a lunch, and that would probably be difficult to do both. So. Uh, we haven't really given that option as an option of going home for lunch and coming back because uh, the experience is that sometimes a lot of kids don't come back, <laughs> particularly secondary. Uh, and it, it might also mean another impact for parents in terms of convenience, having to get a child from school, get them home and get them back for what would only be maybe another couple hours. Uh, but you're right, Mr. Armour, everything is on the table right now. And we appreciate input from everyone. And we'll, we'll continue to look at that. All right. Denise is asking, can a student do Delaware County Technical School and Pendelco Cyber? Uh, we've already addressed that. Delaware County Technical School has, has given us the uh, idea that they will be open and operational. Being, as Dr. Stonel said, you can't learn how to do plumbing or baking or, or auto repair from home. Um, can you start off in cyber and go back in person? Uh, we did speak about this. Um, we have to come up with a plan. We will have the option that if you start in cyber, that you would be able to re-enroll in school, I believe. Um, but that is something that still needs to be um, figured out. Is that correct, Dr. Steinle? It is. And, and when we have the uh, open registration for cyber, that there won't be any question about that. So you know, parents are going to want a, a straightforward answer on that. I can tell you that there's two schools of thought, and they're both very legitimate. And you know, the one school of thought says, that if virtual is not working well for a student and a student has to return to school, we shouldn't prevent that from happening. There's another school of thought that is equally valid, which is that our staffing has been decided and predicated based on the number of students who start in virtual. And you know, having them kind of switch and go back and forth has an impact potentially on that cohort size that we have students are in there. Um, but that's a decision will be made for certain over the next two weeks and will be included. Thank you, Dr. Stahl. Mm -hmm. uh, Nicole Harris asked if parents of kindergarten students will be included in the surveys. Um, she had a couple, I'll let you ask, answer that. She had a couple other questions that are, I think I can answer, but go ahead. Yeah, there were, so, there were some issues with uh, incoming kindergarten uh, parents not getting surveys or information because it hadn't been put through the registration process yet. I believe that's been addressed. Um, I'm making a note, Mr. Kamik and I will look into that with technology tomorrow. Once that registration is processed, then that the name on record should be there. When we do a batch survey send, you should get that, but we will look into that. Thank you, Doc. Uh, what about requirements for restrooms? Once again, there will be a reopening plan sent out to parents that would address restrooms and sanitation and stuff of that nature. Uh, will we, will we require? requirements for vaccines if and when available. Uh, we're gonna leave that to the experts. Uh, there will be, I'm sure, um, guidance from the CDC and the, and the 
World Health Organization and, stu and such. Um, and we will follow whatever guidance we are given through the, uh, the professionals, I would say. Is that correct, Dr. Steinle? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, the issue of vaccinations is not one that, you know, we, we would make locally. I'm, I'm certain that that will be driven by uh, statewide requirements. Correct. Right. Um, are before and after care allowed to operate? They are allowed to operate. Uh, we, uh, Mr. Kameka, uh, has been in contact with today's child. Uh, how that operation goes for them uh, is still to be determined. Uh, we know that the before and after care uh, centers in any school district are uniquely challenged by this, right? Uh, they have to be able to pay the bills. They can't open and lose money. And yet they need to have a, a, leg a legitimate number of students in the program to be able to justify its operation. We've been told they intend to operate, they intend to provide service, but certainly they're still waiting for our decisions and then we're waiting for their recommendations on how they're gonna be able to run the program and still make sure that kids uh, remain socially distant. Thank you. Uh, Amanda Scott asked if at any point in-person education resumes, we become concerned for the safety of our children, can we switch to cyber? We've already addressed that. You can at any point, uh, if you do not feel safe sending your child to school, we do have our cyber platform available for virtual learning. Um, what, what happens if a teacher or student tests positive? We've already addressed that. Um, if the virtual school is still an option, if the district impl implements the hybrid model, uh, that would be correct. We will still have our uh, Pendelco Online Academy. Um, also, will the parents have the opportunity to change from virtual to in-person and vice versa if their choice is not working out? If so, is there any cutoff date for the change? Um, as we discussed before, we would uh, allow the change. Uh, we have talked about limiting the amount of times. We don't want some, what we would like to prevent is one week virtual and then one week back to classroom and, and that, that switch doesn't give any child any kind of uh, routine or any way to actually get settled into what they're actually doing. So is that the answer you would have given there, Dr. Steinoff, that yes, you can, but we would like to limit the amount of times if possible? Yeah, we, again, this is a, an issue that I still want to flush out a little more deeply. Um, you know, it raises different issues. So some parents will feel that, well, this students who are in cyber weren't in the cohort. And we'll get, so again, there's about three competing issues all uh, that are legitimate with respect to the ability of a student to go in and out. But I absolutely agree that what we can have is someone saying, well, you know, this, my, my son's driving me crazy. He's got to go back to school. And then after a couple of weeks, he says, you know what? I miss virtual mom. I want to stay home. Well, I'll put him in virtual. Like, it, we just can't operate that way. Uh, but at the same time, we want to be realistic and understand that some parents might say, we've tried virtual. It's been going on for three months. It's not working out for us do we have options? And we want to provide options for people. And the July 29th plan will be very clear about that. Thank you. Um, Ed Mongaluzio, his first part of his question is pertaining to someone um, testing positive. We've already addressed that. Um, the second part of his question, uh, let me see. If we choose to do cyber school in September, we'll wish to transition in person school or vice versa. How would that work? We've already addressed that. I did say thank, um, he does appreciate how difficult the whole situation is. Just trying to figure out the simplest way to ensure my kids don't get sick. Um, Kathy Holcomb, will virtual students be able to participate in school sports? Absolutely, Kelly. Um, as always, any anyone attending our cyber charter and or a charter school within the district um, is still able to partake in all of the class activities and sports. Uh, David Gornstein, how does Pendelco Cyber differ from what was done in the spring? Um, I'll let, I think that's a question for either Dr. Steinoff or Mr. Kaminka. Um, I know what we wound up with in the spring was a mad rush of um, overwhelming stature for, the, for Schoology. Um, so it is much different, but I will let uh, the professionals answer that question. <laughs> well, I think people are tired. People are probably tired of hearing from me. So let's turn it over to our very able <laughs> superintendent and give him an opportunity. Yeah, sure. It, um, 
we have we have the resources as we spoke about with apex uh, learning um, we also have for elementary we have edusier and other program platform that we could be utilizing but it's all contingent on how many students may not return uh, to brick and mortar uh, because that may be able to free up our teachers to provide virtual learning to our students and then then it will look similar but more enhanced than we experienced in the spring. So it would be our teachers providing the instruction. There would be um, much more live instruction, much, um, more live student interaction, more live student to student interaction and collaboration, um, much more interaction between uh, uh, when it comes to uh, assessments, a different look at assessments, maybe more project based learning versus multiple choice, even exams. So a lot of professional development will be done. Is, planned and it's going to be happening in the coming weeks actually we'll be reaching out to teachers in the next couple of days to enhance that virtual learning experience so uh, in that in that respect uh, we have a lot of different avenues we can go down but we feel our teachers can provide that virtual instruction uh, even better than the apex and edusier platforms that we have so we'll be looking to utilize them thank you mr kameka um also part of his question was asking uh well, students who start to school from home have the option to move into the classroom. We've already addressed that. Vice versa. Uh, one of the important parts of his question was, does Pendelco Cyber Plan have the capacity to support 100% of the students from home? Um, I feel, uh, and I think the administration would, would uh, side with me on this, that we are in a much better situation today than we were in the spring. Um, we had about three days to prepare to get all of our kids on a virtual platform. And we are working diligently to make sure that we uh, we have that available if it comes to that. Um, Diane Connolly Calhoun is a virtual cyber learning program, the Apex program. Is that correct? Uh, Go ahead, Everett. Yeah, that's one of our uh, programs for six to 12 that we've utilized for students have, who have signed up in our cyber program over the past uh, about two years now. Um, but as I say, and actually we would use Edusier for elementary because Apex does not do K-5. Uh, so Edu, Edusier is an option. Uh, however, if we are able to utilize our teachers and we're able to free them up to teach virtually, we will utilize that first because that, that will bring more of the student to teacher interaction that we're looking for. Um, it says, I understand, this is from Pat Twizzler, I understand the split A-B approach for the safety of the students, but ultimately the staff will be there every day, possibly spreading the virus. Uh, the A-B platform is designed to be able to social distance the children, um, and students for that matter, because some of them are not children. Um, the, the teachers will still be social distancing from the students, whether they're there five days a week, three days a week, two days a week whatever it may be. Um, unfortunately, some of our teachers are a little bit more um, up close and personal in their teaching method. That's gonna have to change, but that would be the answer uh, from me for that. Is that correct, George? Yeah, I mean, that's correct. I mean, in the end, you know, the teacher's coming in every day. Uh, they're working with half of the students. So theoretically, if we were informed in the afternoon that a staff member had the virus, then theoretically, at least half the students didn't work with that teacher that day. Um, right. So on, if they if everybody comes in every day, the teacher ordinarily would have potentially communicated that to an entire class where now it's cut down in half. But even with that being cut down in half, you know, we still have physical distancing in place. We still have masks. We still have face shields, so there's other mitigation methods that we would hope um, will have worked. You know, just because just because the teacher has it, of course, we know doesn't mean that the people that they work with will also get it. Thank you. Um, will there be easement on truancy issues if parents need to keep kids home more often or longer? Uh, we've addressed that earlier. Um, this the federal government and state gives us mandates for truancy. Um, until they change that, we have to adhere to their regulations. Um, can Dr. Steinhoff, this is from Janelle Abnett, can Dr. Steinhoff speak about high school sports as of right now? We did address that earlier. As of right now, um, um, PIAA has said that they are planning to go forward with uh, fall sports. Um, 
we don't know that that may change tonight. It may change in the morning. As of right now, that it was their comment at five o'clock tonight. So we will take their take their uh, recommendation and, and follow their guidance. Um, Kelly Manson, what about kids with high risk conditions like asthma? Um, we will leave that to, uh, if you'd like to, I don't know if Dr. Steinhoff can answer that, but it's obviously the virtual platform is available um, and we don't necessarily want to address any specific issues, but. Well, my, you know, Mr. Armour, my guess is it might be with respect to, you know, the use of masks and asthma and, you know, there, there are, we understand that there are medical conditions that some people have that we have to accommodate. So in some of the large city plans that have already been shopped around, um, they've acknowledged that, you know, with a medical note from a doctor indicating that there's a certified medical condition that does not permit the use of a mask, um, that's something that school districts should be obligated to work for. You know, again, that's the advantage of having students being uh, more than six feet apart, right? Where the person who might have asthma maybe wears the mask during transitions or when they're around, but then at least has that opportunity to be able to breathe more clearly. So um, there's a lot of students with these conditions. Those issues are going to be resolved before the start of school. A lot of uh, schools are opening up in August, late August, before Labor Day. Um, not necessarily so much in this region, but certainly nationally. And we're following how those issues are resolved so that you know, it can be child friendly. Thank you, Dr. Stein. Um, T. Testa asked if high school students will receive more efficient tech devices for potential virtual learning. Uh, at this time, we have chosen to um, go the direction of Chromebooks. Um, that is what we are sticking with. Um, for us to reissue a, say, per se, laptop or something of that nature to every student in the high school before the beginning of the school year would not be feasible or uh, financially or physically. So um, I think that's where we're at with that. April asked if we purchase face shields for our children, would they be allowed to wear them or does it have to be a mask? We've already addressed that. It should be allowed unless we get any other guidance from uh, the profession. If parents are not comfortable sending their kids back to school in full or hybrid mode, is there an option for virtual learning? We've addressed that. We do have a virtual uh, academy through Pendelco and we are, it is ramped up to be um, very sufficient at the time. Uh, is the cyber school synchronized with the in-school classes? Will cyber school include the electives chosen? Uh, I would say cyber does not have electives for some sort, is that correct, Dr. Steinhoff? Yeah, I'm going, you know, I'm going to continue to let Eric answer these. Yeah, we do. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, we do. Um, and actually, um, our intent, if we're utilizing our staff, if we have the ability to use our staff for virtual learning, which we anticipate we will, we'll be able to run um, most of our high school electives as we, as we think right now. Um, a backup option would be to utilize APEX um, they do offer electives uh, very similar to what is offered at the high school. In fact, some of our students have already uh, taken advantage of this resource uh, when scheduling did not align and they wanted to take maybe an advanced placement course or a more targeted um, course that just didn't fit in their already robust schedule that they already had at the high school. We put them in Apex for maybe one course at the high school. So a lot of options there for, and uh, to be flexible for our students. Thank you. Um, it also asks if they have to wait to go back to in-person until the end of the marking period. That is not a requirement. Uh, Julie asked, has anyone reached out to OLC to utilize their facility to help elementary schools deal with COVID? I'm working from home with one computer. How can I get an extra Chromebook if needed? Um, we did, have not reached out to OLC. Uh, that would require, if we were able to do it, that would require closely, you know, doubling our staff for whatever classrooms we have over there. Um, it was an option when, you know, during construction for Coburn, but I don't see how we could put kids in that school and have adequate staff to, uh, to staff the building. Would you agree with that, Dr. Stano? Yeah, I mean, we would have to staff up a, a lunch operation, potentially right. another school administrator, another school nurse. So, 
you know, if we needed another location, we certainly would go back and look at OLC. Um, but we, but we don't, you know, at this point in time, we don't need another location um, at this point in time. Correct. Thank you. Um, also, how do I get an extra Chromebook? Uh, you would contact the IT department and they could help you out there. Beth Davis asked if cyber school and virtual the same curriculum or two separate learning programs. Um, the cyber school is not the same as a blended virtual learning would be. Uh, cyber school is, is strictly a online learning platform where the virtual would be working at home back to class the next day. Um, teacher would be reviewing what you were doing yesterday on your own and then moving forward with the curriculum for the day. So hopefully that, uh, that answers that question. Um, Ian, I'm not quite sure what that says. It's just, a, I think maybe a kid was typing. Uh, Julie, thank you for all your efforts. Um, David Gornstein told you you were on mute, Dr. Steinhoff at 843. Um, Gene Michaels, what about the bathrooms? Will they be able to be cleaned after each use? Um, that is that is in the plan. Um, I don't necessarily know that each after each child or student use the restroom, we could go in and that's just not feasible, but it, they will be adequately cleaned and sanitized. Yeah, um, I, I haven't seen any guidance that requires you to clean after every time the bathroom is utilized by a person. I haven't found that guidance yet. It's probably because uh, the most effective thing you could do is wash your hands. So, right. you, know, they're, you know, they're washing their hands after their use, but, but there will be more opportunities in our cleaning protocol to go in and clean all those areas, especially bathrooms. Um, Beth McClure asked, as we know, fevers and symptoms are not guaranteed that someone is carrying the virus. What's the protocol for that? As we stated before, we will have a protocol that is given to us uh, that we need to follow. Um, Gene Michaels, if a child tests positive in a classroom, same thing, we've answered that one already. Um, Subservice asked, if your child doesn't have a fever, is it still a 24 hour rule or do they have to wait longer? Once again, that'll all be um, portrayed in the in that plan. Um, it could be longer. Um, we will leave that up to uh, our guidance from Chester County. Um, Gene Michaels also asks, is there a number of cases would close the school? Is there a plan that indicates that it that isn't safe? That guy. Uh, that guidance would come from the health department if they saw a number of cases and they said it's time to close the school, we would follow that guidance. As we did in March. Um, Christy Shelley, what's the AB approach with students need to be homeschooled on the days that are not in the classroom? And yes, that the answer to that would be they would be on Schoology as they were in the spring. Um, they would have a certain amount of work that needs to be done. Um, and then that would, as as of now, if I'm not mistaken, Dr. Sonoff, that would be the, the start of the next day, going over that and answering any questions that the student may have. Yeah, so you know that, that's the next phase once we decide if uh, we're gonna do a hybrid option, if that's the board wants to do, then the next piece is to decide if that can implement it. And some school districts are looking at uh, one day a week where everybody is on virtual so that our staff spends that time and teaches everybody virtually and uses that time to develop the digital coursework that the kids will do when they're at home. Um, but certainly, you know, that every other day, the teacher is still teaching every day. Right. They have half the kids in front of them. So they would absolutely, you know, they definitely would have a challenge to be able to provide that at-home instruction every day. So there would, no question about it, you know, be some work the kids would have to do on their own. And we understand at the younger age that that requires, you know, a commitment uh, by an older sibling or a parent to help them with that. Thank you. Um, is the cyber program run through Schoology? Um, that is not run through Schoology. Schoology runs our virtual platform. It is an Apex program. I think we addressed that earlier, but it is not. So Renee, Kate, any news about fifth grade parties, end of the year celebrations or graduates or those going on to new schools? Um, I do not believe so with the ever-changing, uh, just as, you know, um, Governor Wolf said today, as of midnight tonight, we can't have more than 25 people in a room. That's one reason we are virtual right now. Um, so that's where we will move with that. 
uh, will elementary school be getting a Chromebook? Um, they do, they are not, we will be issue, our intention is to issue all of our middle school Chromebooks this year. Uh, that was one of our initiatives and we are on track for that, uh, but elementary will not. How will hybrid AB model work? Will some students at home and other school given the day? I assume teacher won't be expected to pay attention to their in-class students and home students need the same time. What's a quarantine? We've already answered most of them about the quarantine policy of test positive. Um, Edward said, ask Devos. I'm not sure what that means. Kate okay, Biglow asked, I wrote this question down beforehand. What are we doing to get ahead of the Cyber Charter's marketing campaigns? How are we ed educating our district's families about the cost when it says free tuition? 10 to 15 families with two to three kids each could cost the district 1.25 million. Uh, personally, I'm pleading with families in the township Facebook groups to not believe the marketing campaigns and explore the Pendelco School District cyber option. Um, I think we touched on that quite a bit earlier. Um, we would, uh, we did talk in, in extensively about this. Um, a cyber uh, charter program could bankrupt a school district. Um, I don't mean that to scare anyone or anything, but if we can offer the same type of learning at a much um, cheaper cost for just as good of learning, we would hope that our district residents would understand that that's something that uh, we would, hopefully they would take advantage of what we have to offer. Is that not quite sure how we would market it. We've put it out there. Um, we would like to hope to think that um, our residents would like to keep our budget in mind as well as uh, their taxes. <laughs> um, Renee asked about the quarantine. We've addressed that. Durbano, is there a virtual learning days going to be the same as it was in the spring? Is there a way to have a camera in the classrooms? We did talk about uh, possibly having a um, live feed classroom for the kids when they are on their off day. That's something that we need a lot more discussion about, a lot more um, um, digging into by our IT department. How is it, um, you know, how is it secure? How is it possible? Definitely an option. I'm pretty certain we're not going to be able to get that off the ground by the start of school. But hey, maybe maybe for the second trimester, if this is still lurking around, we can, uh, we can work on that. Um, Jeff asked, what's the idea for recess in elementary schools? Will the class day finish earlier? If we forego them and lunch, it might be easier on the children to go home sooner. Um, we did address that. There may be a, say, you know, by one o'clock, the kids would be going home. I can let Dr. Steinhoff chime in there. You know, uh, right now we are, are trying to build even a hybrid option that it's certainly at the elementary level presumes that they'll be there for the day for consistency of purposes, uh, you know, for parent planning and those type of things. So at the moment, you know, on July 15th, uh, we're trying to build a schedule that does not require us to, the elementary kids at least, to go home early. Uh, we have a couple of principals who are looking at that. Uh, in the sense that, you know, maybe they would have their expressive arts virtually at home. Maybe they would get home earlier having to deal with the mask, um, but we're not there yet. And part of that reason is because the kids are already only there every other day in a hybrid model anyway, or less. You know, the kid, it may be that students are only at school uh, as few as two days a week. So, you know, you'd like that to be full days if it can be, if it can be done. Uh, we do want to get them outside. Uh, we do want to get them out for recess that, you know, we're not taking that away. Uh, but we also recognize in the wintertime, you know, recess might mean that, you know, the, the kids are in a large common area spread out and, and maybe watching, you know, an, a, an appropriate kind of kids show or a Disney type event for that break, where they can just sit down, relax, and just be a kid. Um, but th there's challenges with recess, and all the principals are working with their colleagues and peers across the area to figure out how do you do that to make it fun for kids. And you know, imagine elementary recess where you can't go near one another. That, that, that's a whole different kind of elementary recess than anybody's that anybody is. Used. Certainly won't be fifth grade guys, you know, fighting over a basketball. You know, that's not going to happen. Um, 
Diane asked, she's aware of the Apex Learning. It seems as if you cannot attend the program until a certain grade. She has a second grader in the kindergarten. Has that changed and will her children be able to attend? I'm going to talk about that one. Yeah, if you could just give her, you know, yeah. is it available for second grade in kindergarten yeah. or? Uh, Apex is not. Apex only goes from grade six through 12 and um, Educere is K through five. So we would utilize Educere for K, actually K through 12. I'm sorry, Educere goes beyond. Um, but uh, we'll be using Educere if we need to. But again, I would say that if we're in that situation where teachers are available to teach virtually, we're going to select them first because they'll have more of that direct alignment with our curriculum as well as the uh, student teacher interaction we know will be uh, even better than what edges here would have. Thank you. Um, Haley Street asks if the blended plan where the classrooms are split into two separate groups or both groups still taught by the same teacher. Um, we did uh, address that um, saying that, you know, splitting the classes will give us the opportunity to have the teachers as well as the students social distance and keep their six foot um, area. Uh, if we do not split, we would only be able to uh, do the three foot. Um, did Dr. Steinhoff say Northland Middle School will have Chromebooks? Jeannie, yes, we did say that, and that is the case. Um, Natalie asked, will the nurse contact CCHD before contacting the parents if a child shows symptoms? Uh, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, that all parents are contact, they are the first line of contact. Is that correct, Dr. Steinle? Yeah, I, have to, I have to look through the protocols, but you know, we, we, we tend to try to do everything with parents as well as the health department. You know, um, I'm not sure we're going to, I'm not sure what the nature of that is. I mean, it's certainly we're, we're going to tell parents if, if their kid is symptomatic, we're going to let parents know, that's for sure. Correct. Um, so Penny O'Donnell asked, please define the remote learning method in a hybrid or remote learning. Will secondary schools be Zoom setting classes in lieu of just assignments on Schoology? Uh, that is all still part of the plan. We are trying to work through that the best we can and uh, take all possibilities into account. Um, so I don't know that we necessarily have a definitive answer for that. How will interventions be addressed outside of special ed? Please know I understand that the core curriculum needs to be addressed first. That was also from Kate Bigelow. Um, did you want to address that? Uh, Eric? Sure, yes. Um, interventions will continue. We're already talking about in the virtual, in a virtual world that we would have more small group instruction, more differentiated instruction. Um, our reading specials will be accessible. Our EL teachers will be accessible. Um, special education teachers will be, um, be, be providing that live instruction as well. So reading specialists, EL teachers, all our intervention uh, teachers will be having that live interaction um, on a daily basis with our with our um, students. So it, the interventions will be there and uh, we're gonna do some training around how to even do guided reading virtually. And some of our teachers started to do it towards the end of the spring semester. So that's another PD area that we're gonna further develop for the fall. Thank you, Mr. Kamika. You're welcome. Shannon Boyd says, you say the kids with a fever of 99.5 or 100.3 needs to be kept home. If it exceeds the 10 days, will truancy letters be sent out? Um, so I think we've addressed that earlier. Uh, with situation, that would be um, on a case by case basis, I guess. Is that correct, Dr. Sano? Yeah, I, you know, I anticipate that the Department of Education will probably work with some legis I guess my guess is that there's going to have to be some flexibility to uh, the attendance requirements for this coming school year, without a doubt. So, you know, we're going to try to approach that with common sense, but at the same time, we're going to follow the guidance that comes out from the state on how we have to record keep uh, with regards to those students who are going to be out. So it's going to be, let's hope it's not a common issue, but it could potentially be a common issue. We understand that. So, we may have to mark people as being absent but excused. And again, you know, uh, we're, we're going to go into this year recognizing that we're here to support and help. Um, but at the same time, you know, we want to make sure that, you know, kids are accountable for the work. 
Uh, Nikki Stanley, I work in transportation, how would us as bus drivers and bus aides, what would it look like when we come back to the bus depot? Um, yeah, so it's possible uh, that, you know, like the bus orientation may have to be done in smaller groups because of the size. You know, we typically have, you know, all 50 of our drivers come back for one meeting. Um, so that, that may have to be held uh, separately. There may have to be five orientations of 10, that type of thing. Uh, but our, our bus drivers are also going to, you know, receive the same kind of consideration for PPE and for their protection as well, um, particularly given the fact that, you know, they're going to be interacting with so many students on a daily basis. Thank you. Uh, will students be able to wear face shields as we addressed that earlier? Yes. Um, Nadine's mommy, I think it says. Hello to all. Thank you for the info tonight. I'm wondering whether or not masks will be worn all day. I'm in the elementary school library and need to see their fit, their smiling faces, smirks and their emotions. Also, it'll be hard for them who are not seeing their faces. Um, when they are able to social distance with a six foot parameter, they will not be required to wear their mask. In transition on the bus and less than six feet, they will be required to be have a mask or shield, correct? Yeah, I mean, I, I would tell kids, particularly younger kids, that they're gonna be expected to wear masks a lot, you know, a lot. And, they, and I would say the parents of younger kids wanna to start to practice that, having that mask going at home for 15 minutes when they're watching a TV program, you know, have, tell them to put the mask on so that they just get comfortable to having it on for longer periods of time and maybe try out different masks as well. You know, another piece to that issue in terms of the library and those kind of things, um, a lot of transition will be eliminated. So resources will be coming to kids rather than kids going to resources. Thank you. Um, is there going to be a sample of the cyber learning prior to the start of it? Uh, Eric? Uh, We'll have promotional materials, you know, that'll go out. Um, and, you know, hopefully that'll answer the questions the parents have about that. Again, Mr. Gorniak's working all that. He's been at the manager of that program now for about, you know, week and a half. And uh, he's working with Lisa Pomerini on promotional materials that'll, that'll try to answer as many questions as possible about the program. Thank you. Uh, Mike asked how before and after care will be handled since two schools are on location. We are still working on that program. That's going to be up to um, them to provide us with information that shows that they can provide that service at a social distancing level. Um, Steven Peterson, is there, if there's a suspected case, I think we uh, already addressed that. Um, Kate Wiggins, if kids will be doing virtual learning, will teachers be doing more live, live lessons along with pre-recorded videos? So the kids, if it's blended, they will be seeing their teacher every other day. If they're on the virtual platform uh, through the cyber um, chart or through our cyber academy, they would have the interaction as needed with their teacher. Correct, Dr. Stano? Yeah, and I think that question was about virtual only. So if, if the whole district had to go back to virtual, uh, will there be asynchronous learning where there's material for students to, to, to get to them themselves, maybe with at-home assistance or parent assistance? or if they're going to be more synchronous learning where the teacher is actually leading it with Zoom or other one-to-one -one type work digitally. And, you know, that is feedback that every superintendent is hearing from parents, you know, across the country, which is that they understand the need for virtual. And they felt that for those students that didn't work well, it didn't work because there wasn't enough direct instruction from teachers. And that's probably what she's speaking about. So the goal is to try to provide virtual support that involves more direct instruction and more interaction with teachers rather than just posting something online and saying, you know, do the choice board and do the work. And, you know, I'll check in with you from time to time. Uh, you know, we're very well aware of the feedback uh, on, on that aspect of virtual learning. Thank you. Uh, April asked if I heard if for the time frame for Chromebooks, would the middle schoolers get them before school starts? I, the plan was to get them rolled out with the start of school. Um, and that would still be the plan, if I'm not mistaken. Um, yeah, you know, the if probably referred to, will they be here, you know, before the start of school? So, you know, the, the plans to purchase that was made a long time ago. Um, the issue is that around the country, just about every district is, is buying more devices right now. So, you know, that's my only pause is that, you know, we don't have them yet. 
right? But those six weeks, that will be for the start of the school year. As soon as we get them, we'll distribute them. Okay. Um, if we go to the hybrid model, what would the plan be for kindergarten? Two half days or two full days? Yeah. Great question. Uh, we haven't determined that yet. That'll be something for the next two weeks because there has been some discussion about, you know, maybe it's one full day instead of two half days. Uh, we, we really have to look a little closely into that. We want to look as well at the uh, number of students who are coming back for kindergarten. Some parents of uh, students in kindergarten, particularly of late, late birthdays, are saying, you know, I might, I might keep my kid out of kindergarten this year. You know, I might want to withdraw that, res uh, that registration. That will change certainly the whole experience. You know, if a class of 18 suddenly goes down to a class of 11 or 10. Um, how will bus drivers handled if a student's picked up without a mask? Will drivers have masks available to provide the students? Yes, they will. Uh, we'll make sure there are adequate masks throughout the operation. Williams family asked, what about recess with the elementary classes and gym? Um, we're still working through how recess is going to work. Hopefully we can hold gym outside when weather permitting. Um, if not, they will be held inside and social distanced. Uh, Colleen Smith, if the school goes to AB schedule, will siblings be put on the same schedule? Uh, yes, we addressed that earlier. It would be A through, say, L, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, this week, Tuesday, Thursday, next week, and then the other half of the alphabet, the other two, which would keep the, the kids all on the same schedule. JS, once a plan is approved, could it be changed closer to the school year? Absolutely. Um, it changed uh, Dr. Steinhoff over the past week probably three times. Um, a week ago, all superintendents thought that we were getting back to school um, in person five days a week. Um, over the past week, that's changed three times. So it could change tomorrow. It could change three times, 10 times over the next six weeks. But uh, we will try and do our best to keep everyone informed as to how we uh, have to do it. Um, Ashley asked how many... How many masks will they need to bring with them? If they touch the mask, will it be considered dirty? Uh, I, will they have to change them? I, I would say if your child has a, a mask for school, it would be sufficient. Um, they're not gonna stay sparkling clean, but as long as it's their mask and they hold on to it, it's only their uh, germs on it. <laughs> Maybe a spare in the book bag. Um, that, that's still part of the plan that we have to figure out. But if a, if a child, uh, Obviously, masks became dirty. We would have a replacement for them. Um, Lisa McGrath, if a parent needs to be at work and a hybrid model is used, can the children work with their parents in the evening? Um, that is something we're still working on, Lisa. We, we totally understand that, that it's gonna be a work in progress to figure that out. Um, I would think as long as the effort is there and the work is getting done, uh, we would have to, you know, address that when we can. I could jump in on that one too, if you don't mind. Sure. Um, one of the things, if we did a live instruction, we have the capabilities of recording that as well, live so that in that situation, in that scenario, um, the, the, um, the parent and student can access it at a later time. So that is a, something that we are looking at and exploring as well. Okay, thank you. Ed asks, since most of the questions were already answered, well, could kids slide into cyber in the event they needed to quarantine to not fall behind? Um, I would think we could move, we could figure that out and get them to a virtual platform. Um, you know, instead of coming to school every other day, they would get their stuff done online. That's a pretty, um, Directed question. I would I would hope that we could be able to make that work out. Um, Frank Abbott asked, "What will be done with the students who refuse to wear masks or wear them properly to ensure the safety of other children and staff?" I'm sorry, Mr. Armour. Read me that one more time, please. Uh, what will be done with a student who refuses to wear a mask or wear them properly to ensure the safety of other students? Yeah. So, you know, we're, we're educators and our job is to educate kids on, on the clear need to keep themselves safe and to keep others safe. So that's, that's the environment that we're gonna open. We're gonna open an environment that says, we're a school district that honors 
state and government orders, right? There's a there's an order for you to wear a mask under certain conditions. And we're going to honor that because that's what you do. You know, if it says you can't drive more than 65 miles per hour, that's what you do. You don't drive more than 65 miles per hour for your safety and for the safety of others. So we'll take that approach in terms of, you know, when you come into our building, there's an expectation that you behave a certain way. In your house, you don't want to wear a mask. You don't have to wear a mask in your house because there are the rules in your house. But the rules in the school mean we want people to take care of themselves, most importantly, take care of others as well. Um, if we continue to have that kind of obstinance and, and battle over it, you know, administrators will talk with the, with the uh, parents and will explain the issue that this could become a very divisive matter. Uh, perhaps they would be encouraged to do virtual as an option. You know, if this is something like, nope, I'm not going to do it. Don't care about everybody else. I just, I'm not doing it too bad. You know, that, that's where administrators would have to have that discussion with them. But um, I'm also not going to make a commitment that, you know, that flies in the face of the reality. And the reality is that um, currently, you know, we can't put mask wearing into a uh, code of conduct for discipline because we have obviously all these different issues with medical needs and things like that. So I'm hope I'm optimistic we're going to be able to avoid that. And I'm optimistic that when kids come in and they see that, my gosh, 99% of the school's wearing masks, I probably a smart thing to do, isn't it? I think I need to do it too. That's the approach um, that I think we should take. Stephanie Fitzgerald asked a question that we already addressed about uh, keeping class um, lists the same so they would, wouldn't have that problem. Emily asked, are the district's liabil liability and workers' compensation policies going to cover proven exposure either through staff or student will it increase insurance rates? Will you be requiring liability waivers of parents for on-campus education? Um, I think that's more of a, a legality question. Yeah, I, I don't know if uh, we, we would have exposure to liability, you know, in the same sense that if somebody, you know, went to Wawa and they, they believe that they got COVID at Wawa, I don't know if Wawa would be liable, you know, because a person may have transmitted it. So I'm not hearing about districts having liability issues and concerns over that. Um, we, you know, we have, we've got great counsel and great advisors for insurances. And if we feel that the circumstances change and we have to get uh, increased coverage for potentially workers' compensation, you know, is an issue there that we're aware of that we're following that. So that, that could be the case. Not really too concerned about, you know, liability because of uh, someone might pick up the transmission. I'm more concerned about the health and safety issues that will come with that. Okay, thank you. Um, if, if a student sees a reading specialist or any other small groups pull out, will this still be an option in school? Yes. Uh, it, 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 could, uh, it, you know, it could look differently. Uh, you know, we're working on putting in, uh, you know, what they're calling like desktop sneeze guards, if that has to happen, um, you know, but it, it could look differently. And it may also be that we may have to take some of those specialists and, and repurpose them. So. Uh, it'll begin with, you know, the IEP needs, then the support needs, then the regular education needs. So a lot of that's driven by what you need to have. I, I don't want to make a guarantee, but our hope is to continue reading support if a student needs it. All right. Um, how much in-person teaching will be conducted in the cyber learning? It depends. It's going to depend on the amount of interest and the amount of teachers that we dedicate to cyber learning. Mr. Armour, if you don't mind, I mean, I could try to read through some of these just quickly. <laughs> You know, I, I don't want to take over for you. No, no, I, I, I don't want to. I was trying to um, make sure that we tried to address every, yeah, everyone's sure. questions and comments. It is getting rather late. Um, let, me, let me take a look at a couple, if you like, then. Fire drills, shelter in place. Uh, school districts are aware of that. Superintendents have been having conversations with the Department of Health leaders on that regard. Uh, so we understand that there's issues with that. Um, safety will always come first. And so I think in a true emergency, uh, we have to evacuate a building. People are going to evacuate a building and they're not going to worry, you know, about the six feet distancing. The safety issue will come first. Uh, if someone's making a transition, is there an overview? Yes, we'll have more information on uh, the platform. Uh, why don't we utilize the new facility? Uh, again, you know, we don't need charity. We can utilize our own facility. The issue would be we would have to almost duplicate our staffing, certainly for support staff. You would need another nurse. You would need another uh, cafeteria. Um, there's also a lot of supports that we pulled out of there. It took us about six months to get that building ready to be able to utilize it for our standards. So um, at the moment, we don't, we don't need charity, but we're always looking at it as a backup option. Um, last month, a comment was made. About we can skip. Let's skip that one. Okay. Um, can you do Pendelco Cyber School uh, while going to Delaware County Tech School? Yes, we're looking at that because it's a half-day program. 
Um, we'll have to, again, you know, we'll have to see if that matches up. Um, we would hope so. My, uh, going into kindergarten with asthma, uh, is there an opportunity to take a mask off? It's going to depend on the amount of kids in class. We also know we're trying to build in mask breaks. You know, we get, we get this, that this is going to be a challenge for kids. So it, it'll be a kid-friendly opportunity to the best extent that we can. Uh, yes, we'll have recess. Um, are you going to be able to socialize? Yes, with the limitations that we're talking about. So for whatever that is, I guess they're going to have to yell and scream a little further because they're not going to be on top of one another. Um, we'll offer a cyber program at all grade levels. Um, people want to thank everybody for the work they're doing. Um, yes, I, you know, our teachers have, have been giving us great ideas. Our administrators have been working 16 hour days, every district, you know, every district is, is trying to figure this out. And particularly small districts like ours where, you know, we can't go out and, you know, hire a consultant to put together the plan for us and a glitzy package and all this and spend millions on that. Got to do it ourselves and we got to do it right by, by families, but thank you for that acknowledgement. Um, yes, if you get registered, you'll be added to the distribution list. Um, if that hasn't happened, it should be happening soon. We try to put everything that we send out also on the webpage. Uh, transitions in the upper grades. Uh, we're working through that with Mr. Lucius and Mr. Sassy. Less kids means more room in the hallway. Uh, we're also looking at opportunities for kids to stay in place and not have to move as often. So that's still being worked out. Um, transportation department coordinate with private schools that transportation department you know, does talk to them um, all the time, you know, particularly the ones where we have to drive students out of state, um, you know, as, as they tell us what their plan is, uh, some of the Delaware schools, for instance, you know, we'll respond as we can. Um, thank you to the board. Uh, tough season. That's right. You know, it, it'll get better. We're here to help. Uh, Canvas uh, used for college classes. Um, we Canvas is very popular in college. There's some local districts that use Canvas. Ridley uses Canvas. Um, comes down to how well people utilize the program and we're aware of Canvas. We're not ready to jump from Schoology because we just got used to Schoology. Um, but I am aware of Canvas. You know, thanks for the ability to tell us about that. We'll, we will keep that in mind, you know. Um, I like virtual, virtual learning, rather Apex learning. I can understand that because teachers were providing, you know, probably more guidance. Uh, how will band work? Uh, you know, the, the Band and chorus is looking less and less likely in the traditional sense. Uh, there's some guidance that the uh, National Federation of Marching Bands put out. We're looking at that, uh, but certainly there's going to be significant, significant uh, limitations to the ability to do band and chorus in, in any way that it was done in the past. You know, we're not going to try to lead kids on and suggest something that they can't. But there's also online learning, you know, smart music program. And, you know, our kids did do some instrumental work at home. Uh, last spring, and we hope that that would be able to continue. Uh, you know, again, issues on attendance and how all that works out, a lot of that to be determined. We'll follow state guidelines, whether excused or not. Is there a cap on the number of students of cyber learning? Um, you know, there's not going to be a cap, um, but, you know, we cyber isn't for everybody, and I think it's important to remember that. You know, we, we think there's value in kids coming to school. We think there's value in being there with our teachers, and if we can do that safely, you know, we would prefer that versus a cyber option. But if families feel differently, we're gonna to try to meet their needs. Um, social distancing, while kids are constantly hugging, it's gonna be a lot of education, a lot of posters. Uh, district's already working on some informational videos that are child friendly. You know, it's gonna to have to be a lot of reminders. But as parents know, you know, you go out to a store and your daughter sees a friend that she hasn't seen since last March. First thing they do is run up and give each other a hug, right? So. Um, it's just a lot of education that we're going to have to try to do, and, and our teachers do it really, really well. Um, if there's band occurring and you have cyber learning, can you do band? Uh, yes. Uh, credit recovery is through cyber, that is an option that we have. Uh, Educere at kindergarten, I have, we didn't offer Educere at kindergarten. Uh, yes. Yeah, we, uh, they do. They oh, do. Thank you. Um, and I'm having uh, Mr. Gorniak, he'll be researching the content. It's hard to find their content online, but uh, he'll be researching that. And uh, But they do say, uh, promote that they are a K-12 platform. Gotcha. Wasn't aware of that. See, I'm learning something every day. Yeah. Uh, cyber learning uh, for specific times to have Zoom meetings uh, with classmates so that there isn't as much of an isolation feeling. Definitely a big issue. We heard a lot of feedback on that. The parents loved it when the teachers hosted Zoom meetings for the classes, the more of that that can happen, the better. Um, so that did come through in the parent feedback that we're sharing. 
Have you considered holding a class to see how students wear with masks? You know, we haven't yet. Um, that would mean that we got to bring everybody together. Um, you know, we'll, we'll see how that looks. Um, we'll see, how, you know, start of the year looks. If we have to make a quick adjustment after day one, that's fine. Um, Dr. Stanov's statement doesn't make sense. If we go with AB model and we find out in the afternoon the teacher has a virus, uh, they might have only given it to half the student. That's patently not true. If a teacher tests positive, they have a virus for at least three days and they could spread it to all students. Yeah, I mean, we, we have no way of knowing uh, when a teacher may have gotten the virus, but um, what my indication is that we at least have the ability in a hybrid model to inform that group of students that they shouldn't come back to a teacher that has told us they have the virus. You know, we'll be able to at least uh, be able to address half the students that aren't there with that person that day. Um, when people get it, how long they've had it, that, that's the challenge of the virus. There's no question. That's the great mystery here. You can be asymptomatic and you could be a carrier. And, and that's, I think, what's creating the problem why we can't solve this nationally, right? Uh, parents who have children and are a little more advanced to volunteer for cyber program um, to make room for children that do better in the classroom. Um, I would, you know, I wouldn't want to put people in that predicament of having to make that choice because of other kids. You know, I'd like rather, hopefully, they'll, you know, they'll make the decision based on what you know they think is right for their kid. Um, have we investigated a hybrid model featuring a weekly stagger versus daily? Uh, we haven't looked at a week. Um, we understand why that may be better in terms of convenience, you know, for families and also the possibility if somebody has the virus, then you have five days out. Um, but we're trying to weigh that against the educational experience for kids of not being in a classroom for five days. And then, you know, you have a kid who might be a reluctant learner and now every five days, you gotta go through that battle. You gotta go to school, you gotta go to school. It's kind of like coming home from vacation. Nobody wants to go back to work the first day. So we're trying to, to balance that issue, you know, of how much should you be going, how regular should you go, that the feel of school remains fresh. Um, but if the board tells us pursue that hybrid model, we'll start to look at all the different options, including how many days that is and whether it is every other day. It could be Monday, Thursday, Tuesday, Friday kind of option. It could be all those things. Uh, we talked about what happens if someone doesn't wear a mask. Um, how do we support teachers and staff to enforce safety guidelines? I witnessed Pendel go out of compliance. I don't want to call them out, but I'm worried. Um, yeah, I, you know, I hope people aren't out of compliance and I hope, you know, certainly employees who don't follow our directives, you know, would, could face, uh, you know, potentially disciplinary action because of that. So I know they'll follow the rules, um, but I think it's still kind of a gray area. Some habits are happening. You know, I, I will walk down the hallway sometimes of central office and forget put my mask on and I got to run back to my office and put it back on. Um, you know, so I, we're just going to have to continue to work with people and enforce the expectations that we have in mind. Um, CDC doesn't recommend face shields. Um, you know, the, the recommendations are all over. Uh, we think it helps. We'll look at that. Um, I hadn't heard that before. You know, they probably say that masks are better than shields. I understand that we have to balance that between the need of a, of a teacher to be able to be seen when they're talking. Um, thank you for being transparent. Yep, we're trying. Uh, air filters uh, will follow the HVAC guidelines that the CDC puts out. Uh, in some buildings, we're doing special work on terms of summertime cleaning of our air ducts and our filters. Um, has there been an update for New York field trip for sophomores getting a refund? Yep. Um, there has not an official update, but that September 12th trip for sophomores certainly does not look good. And the issue there was that the organization would not issue a refund without any issue of credit. I believe Mr. Sassy is trying to at least get the credit if we can postpone it on for a later date. So thank you for the patience on that to be determined. Um, where can we find out more about Pendelco online? That'll be uh, available, I think in about two weeks. Um, keep looking online, we'll push that out when we have more promotional materials available that'll really help pe answer people's questions. Uh, Will it be like the spring when children can complete an assignment by a certain day? Uh, could be a little bit of both. I think if it's an A-B approach, the expectation would be you'll come back ready to work after a day off. It won't be like you get a week to complete the work. My, my belief would be the teachers would expect it. You do that work at home during the day that you're home in between. Um, do elementary students get a Chromebook from the school if they're doing cyber? You know, we have to look at the inventory again and how many do we have on hand? At the moment, I can't promise something that we don't have to give you. Uh, but if it's Pendelco cyber, ultimately down the line, yes, giving you a device would be part of that enrollment outside of the pandemic circumstances. 
Um, there's a discussion about elementary band, yet we are having that discussion, what that might look like. Uh, either there won't be uh, winter concerts. You know, is there an alternative? It's possible it won't happen in school. It's possibly more like an extracurricular activity for a child to play an instrument and practice an instrument at home. Uh, we'll skip this one, George. Okay. That's irrelevant. Uh, what's being done to determine the education level of students after the last set of online learning? Yeah, you know, there's, there's some concern by parents that, you know, there's been regression. Um, what I'll tell you is that, you know, if there's regression, it's likely in um, some specific academic skills, but students actually learned a whole different set of skills through this process, right? First, who would have ever thought we could have first graders learning how to collaborate via Zoom? And that's what we did. You know, we have sixth graders who now know how to cooperate and collaborate digitally and not speak over one another and not have to use the mute button. Uh, we have people who are learning how to do work on their own and digitize that work and send that into the teacher. So, um, you know, I'm certainly aware that you know, they missed time and it wasn't as ideal, but I also want to recognize that in terms of getting kids ready for life, some of our kids learned some skills in this process much sooner than they, than they would have. Um, PSSAs, that's a decision that the state will have to make. It's prob they're probably waiting on guidance from Betsy DeVos. If the federal governments expect the state to do the test, the state will probably have to give the test. I hope that they realize this will be a terrible year to give the PSSAs. We didn't have them this year. And what happened? Nothing, right? The kids are fine. You know, we, we didn't have state tests and, 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 you know, the world didn't blow up. And we, we've said it all along. These tests were absolutely unnecessary. And, uh, you know, we'll see. But at the moment, PSSAs are scheduled for next year. Skip. Uh, when can we see the protocol for COVID positive students? Uh, the answers are vague. Uh, that'll be available online. And that will not be made up by us. That'll be the protocol that we are given from the health department. Uh, can the bus drivers turn away students when they're not wearing a mask on board? Um, we don't think we want kids left alone at a bus stop, so we were going to have backup masks for them. The drivers will have a supply of masks if a kid forgets their mask. Uh, uh, issue about missing a transfer bus, I'm not sure we'd have to work that one out. Um, cyber learning information that's coming, sharing transportation with private schools. We, we always look to try to do that when we can. Oftentimes it doesn't add up. So we, you know, there have been times in the past where we have shared transportation with Chichester if we were going in the same direction. Very often we find out that the matchup just it doesn't coordinate as well as you think that it would. Um, uh, will the insurance payment amount be for the Chromebooks? You know, right now we're, you know, we're giving out Chromebooks for students in the same way that you will be giving a book. Chromebooks are the new books. We're getting very close to the end here. Uh, how will virtual learning work? If not all students have a Chromebook, it would be the same just like we just did last spring. You know, there's a lot of computer devices at home. Some people use the phone. Some people use the Apple laptops that their families have. Some people use the desktop. So uh, we try to provide devices for people that have absolutely no device whatsoever in their home. But we found that most families do have some device. Have we considered an AM PM split instead of AB? Upper Darby's doing that. Um, we did. Uh, feedback from some parents is that if they're getting their child out of bed into school, they'd rather not have to turn right around and go back and get them two and a half hours later. You know, that they would rather, you know, have them there long enough to actually learn something. Um, you know, the AM PM split also cuts it in half again, another hybrid day. Um, so it does make the class smaller. There's some value in that Upper Dar Darby model. Um, obviously, they looked at that, you know, and their community recommended that or their board chose that model. The initial feedback we're getting is that every other day would work as long as parents know what the schedule is. And that's what we'll keep in mind. Um, will there be barriers placed around the child's desk? Right now, we're not providing barriers behind around every single child's desk. You know, we've seen some pictures out of some other countries that have opened up that have had that. Um, you know, we want to also be sensitive to the fact that, you know, a kid coming in and being stuck behind a barrel for six and a half hours every day is a difficult experience. So we think we can keep them safe, um, you know, without the plastic dividers at every single desk. That's where we are right now. That guidance could change. How will technology perform in the elementary setting? We're still talking about that. Students might not be going to the computer lab. The teacher might be coming to them. 
Uh, will IEPs be redone? Yes, there is a process to uh, work individually with every student to update IEPs after this long gap and, and special ed director will reach out with people on that issue. Um, how will middle and high school teachers handle staying in with one classroom? We haven't made the uh, decision that they will have to stay in one classroom. Um, the teachers themselves typically do stay in the same classroom in terms of teachers, you know, going to kids rather than staying in the classroom, still working that piece out. Uh, can you put a list of our questions and answers on the website? Uh, yes, we are building a frequently asked questions section to the website. Uh, support your million percent if you need PTL help. Uh, don't hesitate to ask. Thank you for that. A couple of thank yous. Um, a note this evening, I'm, I'm keeping my comments focused on reopening, which is my role. Uh, frequently asked question on website that can be updated. Yep, we will have that. Again, some of that we didn't have answers to until we briefed the board tonight on where we are. And this is the first time the board has gotten together in July. Uh, what about the school field trip uh, money we paid to that? Uh, refer to the school board, uh, refer to your principal. Uh, any cases that we had where we could refund money, we would refund. In some cases, the agencies would not refund the money to us. So but I would refer you back to Mr. Lucius for middle school issues. Uh, are there plans to implement more black culture learning? Um, also, how can we go about adding ASL learning into K-12? Um, in terms of you know, general review of our uh, cultural curriculum, um, that's happening, you know, nationally districts are all coming to terms with that um, as people have come out and said, you know, I have received a number of emails from, from students. Uh, a lot of them were look like they copied the same email, but it looked like you know, there was an issue that they wanted us to think about. They said, Dr. Stanoff, you know, would you have the teachers take a look at the curriculum to make sure that, that, that it's culturally balanced? And I think all school districts are doing that. And that's something that our diversity, equity, an inclusion committee would do. You know, they would be asked, you know, take a look at our curriculum. You know, are, are we missing some critical aspect of teaching, some critical concept that doesn't get taught, maybe because of our perspective and the bias that we have. So um, yes, that hasn't been forgotten. Uh, if they borrowed a Chromebook, would that be the one they use this year uh, to be determined? We might not be collecting back those Chromebooks that we gave out about 350 of them. Certainly if we do, we'll have to disinfect them and um, it may be easier to just keep them with those families. So we'll be looking at that. Um, can cyber deliver a personal one-on-one -on -one experience for most children? It depends on the model. It depends on the resources that we have. That is the goal. Um, there's, you know, again, some chat comments, you know, about topics in the board meetings and previous board meetings. I can't address those. Uh, why was your comment skipped earlier? It violates the school board's bylaws. Um, I'll let them come back to that one. Can you do half days for elementary students with at home learning is not independent and parent requires parents to work with them. Okay, so can you do half days for elementary students? So yeah, again, um, half days for elementary is not currently something that we're proposing to the school board, but as we get more information in the next two weeks, if that makes sense, and that's the right thing for kids, that could be part of our proposal. Uh, and that's all the comments that I would be able to address. Thank you, Mr. Armour. We, we do have a few people that I see have been hanging on with their hand raised. Is that something, uh, there's only a few of them? Sure, I'll, I'll just, I'll control it. So I'll take it, I'll jump in for you, Mr. Zebley. Chris Karos, I am um, allowing you to talk. Go ahead, Chris. Chris, we can hear you. Go ahead. You have to unmute uh, your button and go right ahead. Um, Dr. Steinhoff, if we don't get it, maybe uh, they we answered their question, okay. something of that nature. Okay. Um, so let me uh, just say oh. in there. And next I have uh, Natalie Del Giorno. Yes, Natalie. Yeah, I'm clicking the unmute audio and it's just not happening. So it might mean that they're not on the call. Maybe they can chat in if they want. Uh, Carrie Sharp, talking permitted. 
Sherry. Hi. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, I'm Sherry Sharp, live here in Aston. I'm a Pendelco resident, voter, and taxpayer, but I wanted to speak this evening in my capacity as a 27-year veteran teacher in the district. I wanted to express how deeply I feel about our kids. Uh, my Pendelco children and the Pendelco staff are my extended family. I know that children need to go back to school to socialize and to build community. It's true. But if we are honest, the in-person in experience we're going to offer this fall may not look like that nurturing, hands-on, joyful experience of school that we all remember. I imagine a scared kindergartner approaching, approaching their teacher in her mask and visor, and she can't reach out to comfort the crying child. I imagine a sixth grader seeing her best friend for the first time in six months being reminded, watch your distancing instead of hugging. I imagine a high school student eating their boxed lunch in, si in silence in a safe but socially distanced classroom instead of recounting their weekend at the table with all the guys. I imagine teachers who can no longer teach in groups with circle time, no playground games, no finger paints, no songs, teachers trying to keep kids on task while every part of what they love about school is stri stripped down. I wonder if this will inspire that lifelong love of learning that we want for them. Does this meet their emotional needs for safety? And if isolation is dangerous for children, so is this bleak version of school. Beyond that, we can't forget that there's a greater hierarchical need. There's a physiological one. We do have a deadly virus whose nature we don't completely understand. Children may fare better, but they may transmit it unwillingly to relatives and friends. Some children may not fare well at all. Some might get sick, some may die. There's nothing more horrific to a teacher than to bury a child, nothing. This spring, so many of you expressed gratitude for the things that we do for children, and we all appreciated that. This fall for teachers though, the very act of doing our jobs is going to go from challenging and rewarding to potentially deadly. We do still have a choice. This spring, we hurriedly launched an online learning program. It wasn't ideal, but given the state situation, we think it was a pretty good start. I'm proposing that while there's still time that we build on that start and we create a rigorous and robust online program for our students this fall. It's the only way we can assure our collective safety and the fastest course back to the rich school experiences that we all know and love. Any in-person school comes with far more risk than I think we should be taking with these young lives left in our charge. And for those of us who have devoted our lives to their care. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Next up, um, I have uh, Mr. Dave Bear. Go ahead, Mr. Bear. Well, I'm just curious if you guys thought about asking parents that uh, have children that um, a little faster learners or a little more advanced if they would, in the case that you have to maybe move to the hybrid that would want to volunteer uh, children, you know, because they might learn a little quicker or whatever. Yeah, I, I, children that need to be. Yeah, I, I think we, you know, we don't uh, want to get into a place where, uh, you know, parents might feel like if my, if my kid is is a bright learner, uh, that you know maybe one option's out for them, uh, so that other kids could be in. You know, we 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 really want to try to keep it flexible for everybody. If whatever the board directs us to do and whatever plan they approve, we want to make sure that regardless of your skill level that you have the same opportunity that everybody else has. And that might mean hybrid, that might mean Pendelco cyber. Um, if we regress it as a region, it could be virtual for all. All right, and last but not least, we have Natalie. I think we tried to let her uh, speak earlier. It looks like she has re-raised her hand. So it might be there now. Yeah, Natalie, uh, if you are on and you want to speak, you are on unmute, so you can go ahead. Okay, I guess not. All right, so that concludes the uh, section of our tonight for public comments. I do um, thank everyone who has attended, hung in there through the end with us to try and get uh, some answers. Hopefully we've given some light to our reopening plan and what the future holds and how, how we'll be addressing it here in the next couple of weeks. Um, unfortunately, we're trying to navigate something that nobody has the exact answer. What may work for, for some families, for some students, for some learning platform may not work for the other. Um, and we're trying to navigate what's best for everyone um, to the best that we can. Um, 
moving forward from that, um, I, th I would like to thank our task force that has spent endless hours trying to uh, fix it, um, trying to find a plan, trying to find something that, that works for everyone. Um, we most definitely will be, will be uh, talking daily, weekly, as much as we can. Uh, we do have uh, another board meeting scheduled, that, which we'll talk about here as soon as I do for future meetings. But do I have any comments by members of the board? All right, see you as none. Um, future meetings, our next meeting is July 29th. Uh, will be our board meeting. Depending upon our possibilities of having it in person, I would assume that that will probably be virtual again, given today's uh, governor's uh, restrictions. Um, if it is not going to be virtual and it will be at Northley, we will put out that information on our district website. Um, further than that, Wednesday, August 19th will be the study session from the service center, hopefully at 730. And then the uh, voting meeting will be August 26th, also at the service center, if possible. Motion for adjournment. Motion adjourned. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Dave. Thank you, everybody.